I'm good to go. I've started recording, so <clears throat> if we can nail this intro first time, I'll be impressed. Don't put a hey, hey you did jeans, <laughs> all right? <Did> you... <laughs> Look, man, I felt like the last podcast was a week ago for me. Okay, I'm fresh. <laughs> all right, yeah, fresh, fresh. All right, you guys ready? Yep. Welcome to the OSRS podcast. I am Mitt Mad Cow. What's going on, boys? Rakes as always. And hi, it's me, Risco. So today. It comes with a great pleasure that I get to introduce today's guest, uh, who is not just an old school RuneScape or a RuneScape free content creator, but somebody who works between the realms and has ascended past the point of just being a one game content creator. Mr. Josh Strife Hayes. Thank you very much, lads, for having me on. I'm very excited to talk about old school RuneScape specifically, and then the MMORPG content sphere, the genre in general, where it's come from, where it's going to. Really happy to answer any questions you've got. We can really discuss all of our experiences in all these games. Awesome. Yes. Sure. Uh, So I I think something like where we can start to begin with, which might be good, is uh, knowing a little bit more about yourself. Um, I've personally watched you for like several years now at this point and i've seen snippets of your history like who you are i i know that you took acting classes i know that you worked in a warehouse when you were younger um how did this how did this all come together like how did josh strife hayes come to be so it's been an interesting life uh yes i did take acting classes i actually wanted to be an actor since i was a little kid since i was seven or eight years old sitting down in front of the tv with a vcr watching golden eye or tomorrow never dies repeatedly and then saying to my mom i want to do that and she looked at me because they were james bond films and she's like oh my god i'm so proud of you you want to serve your country you want to be an mi5 i'm like no no you misunderstand mother uh, i want to be pierce brosnan that's what wants to happen but i wanted to be an actor performer and entertainer all the time and i love that and i've pretty much followed my entire life going through that i i did indeed work in a warehouse moving boxes i was a mechanic on a go-kart track i was a martial arts instructor then I worked as a you know, combat mechanic on a paintball field where I would fix all the guns. Then I started teaching acting and teaching performing. I did a bit of retail. And then I went to university to study acting. But doing all this, I would come home at the end of every day absolutely shattered. And I would sit down and do my favorite hobby, which was play video games, play online games specifically. When I was in school, in high school, I discovered old school RuneScape, just RuneScape at the time. And because it didn't require a download, you could play it on public computers, like library computers or school computers. So everyone was playing RuneScape at the time. I'd get home, boot my laptop up, play RuneScape all night. Mum hated it. But I just remember sticking on full Guffins, standing at the bottom of the stronghold of security and killing Anku incredibly inefficiently for like eight (laughs) hours every single night. Yes. Hell yeah, and that's while I, was, I loved it so much it was terrible and looking back at it now i'm like why are you doing this this is awful but that's the memory that i've got and i enjoy that memory more than efficiently grinding the nightmare zone but while i was playing all these these online mmo games i was getting these banner adverts on the side of my screen for what looks like terrible games uh, league of angels i think was one of them and there was another one ebony and there was always an attractive busty woman it's like the oh. king needs your help i'm like mate if the <laughs> king is dealing with her the king's doing fine okay i don't need to get involved with this but I, they stuck in my mind i remember those and then i thought i'm going to combine my skills as a teacher with my skills as an actor and a video game player and i can teach people how to play video games so i made a guide for how to do this how to play dark souls how to play bloodborne how to play old school runescape how to play this and those guides did relatively well i think one of the most successful ones was terror how to play terror how to level up in neverwinter but the one thing people love more than good stuff is awful stuff I thought maybe I can combine my skills of making videos with downloading and playing these awful looking games. So I downloaded League of Angels, I downloaded Ebony, and I just made reviews of these terrible MMOs, calling them worst MMO ever, which is a very Google friendly title. Yeah. And oh my god, that's a, that's an amazing title. I've literally got that as a note, by the way. I was like, there's no way that did all right, so here's a question. Did you just wing that or did was there thought behind that? Were you thinking about the YouTube algorithm at the time? I didn't expect it to be a series, but I did expect it to be Googleable. And whenever oh, I, dang. people always talk about search engine optimization and what they think that means is 
putting a load of hidden tags and hidden keywords and trying to trick people into you know, clicking on your video or your thing for any reason. Whenever I talk about search engine optimization, people say, oh yeah, you know if you put Fortnite in the tags of your video, it'll pop up for people that like Fortnite. And I said, yeah, but that's not the audience that I'm going for. I don't want that audience because what will then happen is YouTube will show it to thousands of people who like Fortnite. They won't click on my video and YouTube will think my video is lying because there's no human interaction within this tag. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to keep this really hyper-focused and hyper-specific. Sometimes when I'm curious, I Google, I did a couple of years ago, worst MMO ever, worst RPG ever, worst PlayStation 1 game ever, worst film ever, worst book ever, because people love knowing what the worst is. And then I found there was a, a YouTube channel called Team Triple Jump, and they were already doing a series called Worst Game Ever, Worst Video Game Ever with Ben and Peter, fantastic series. But there is nothing new in Hollywood, and every idea is just an iteration on every other idea. So I shamelessly stole the idea of calling it Worst Something Ever, but I just specified the genre. So I went with Worst MMO Ever, here's this. And that video did so well, there was a sequel to the game. So I made a sequel video, and two is the start of a pattern. So then I just made more and more and more and more and more, until if you Google Worst MMO Ever, you have to be shown my videos. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah really, you pretty much bro. Took, took that real estate. <laughs> it took me five years of making content to ever even think about the algorithm, let alone Google. So I'm very mm -hmm. impressed right now that your start was just so strong. Yeah, how but many oh, years ago was oh, that? Now I started Dude. years before. I was making little random RuneScape skits actually oh, with my friends. And that was on a totally different channel. But everyone starts, and this is one of the advice. I was talking to, I did an interview with vidIQ, actually, the people that do all the kind of background tools for ah. everything. And people ask, what is the the most important thing to have when you start a YouTube or a Twitch or a TikTok or whatever you want to start. And it's love, passion for whatever the hell you're doing. So you say, yeah, you started five years ago making videos. You've had five years of loving this. If you hated this, you'd have quit way before now. The fact that you're still here years and years and years on shows there's some genuine passion and love. And if you put enough genuine passion and love out into whatever you make, people will find it. And that love is very obvious. People will watch it because they can tell you actually care. You're not trying to trick them. You're not trying to game the system. You just love what you make. And that's very obvious in videos. Yeah. Bro, you nailed it on the <clears throat> head right there. Because anytime someone asks me, how do you become a YouTuber? I go, make what you watch because you will not be able to make something you don't watch well. And if mm -hmm. you can't enjoy your own content, how do you expect someone else to enjoy it? And it took me a while to learn that, like you were saying. And just, it just, yeah, hit that right on the head there. Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, the advice that I've always given people as well for starting up with like content and stuff is like, I just say, just throw a bunch of videos out there, do things that you enjoy, and then go back after a certain amount of time and just see what did well. Like that, that's what worked for me. I just uploaded random stuff on RuneScape. And then I was mm -hmm. like, oh, people are really interested in the money making series. People really like the time gated stuff. Okay. Let me explore that and see if that does better. And it did, you know? That's that's Rixie's, uh, you know, trademark right there. That's my thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's very very accurate. I mean, in um, in in acting, in teaching, we would tend to refer that as what we call the shotgun method, which is if you shoot enough bullets, you will eventually hit something. And once you realize what you've got, then hyper focus in on that and keep going with that. If you go to the YouTube channel Game Theory, hosted by Matt Pat, and you sort the videos by the oldest video they make his oldest video is a theater video of him singing some of the songs from the musical blood brothers on stage he's singing shoes upon the table which is a great musical song but then he makes his very first game theory video after uploading some of his theater clips and it takes off and then he just hyper focuses in on that the reason that i refuse to remove my old videos from youtube people say to me take your old videos down you are harming your algorithm presence and I say, I appreciate your advice, but to me, having that kind of time capsule to show people, look, I didn't start good. I just, I, my first video was like an unedited three hour playthrough of Dark Souls 3. It's terrible. And then I played all of the Command and Conquer games, all of the Cuphead games, all of Dead Space. I did a 100 day vlog of myself. I put up poems and art. I was just throwing art at the wall and seeing what stuck because it was a lovely repertoire for me to do. And then something happened and I thought, hang on, I can turn this into a job. Everyone that comes to YouTube now wants to be three years ahead of where they are without going through the three years of learning and experiencing, you know, the experience that comes with doing that for three years. Yeah. 
Do you know, yeah, it, for sure. it's, a, it's a funny thing because um, I, I feel like in, in some respects, you and I probably have a slightly similar past in the sense of I too worked in warehouses and, you know, <laughs> I, I worked in factories, I worked dead-end jobs. And um, I remember for me personally, when you work jobs that you dislike, that are just completely like, you know, you're just almost numb, like you're just watching the clock the entire time. It gives you a lot of time to think about what you'd rather be doing, right? <laughs> and I, I'll never forget this one day I was working, I think it was like a 12 hour shift on a Sunday during the summer years ago, boiling hot. I had to wear a hairnet. I had to have like a high vis vest on. And I'm at the end of this machine. And um, cause the managers weren't in on the weekend because it was overtime. I was able to watch Twitch on my phone. And um, I won't name him, but I was watching a RuneScape content creator on my phone and he was complaining about playing the game right and i was just sat there listening to this guy complain and i was thinking i would do anything to swap places with that guy right now like that's where i want to be you know and that really it's very and you know you've hit a really important part there it's very very important that everyone that has found a level of success within the creative endeavors does understand that we are in very privileged positions now there is that fine line to walk where we have lives that many people would look at and covet and want and be envious and jealous of. That's not to say that we don't still have struggles within those lives to take on. I mean, my social life is pretty much dead. I've just decided to not see anyone and totally create content. It's very yeah. difficult to complain about anything while also having a fantastic life that a lot of people would want to have. But what I think is very important, and I've noticed this, I don't know if you guys have noticed this as well, whenever I meet people who are in a position of success or privilege who have struggled to get there, who have understood the you know scrimping and saving to work out where your, your next meal is going to come from and then struggling to pay the bills and you know really trying to force your way through a less than ideal life when you find success you're very much appreciative of what you have all the time i see a lot of people who have been given a great deal of success without having to struggle too hard for it at all without understanding how privileged the position that they are in is so i have been sat there streaming before for seven or eight hours and part of my brain wants to go oh man just complain this is the worst and i think no no standing in a warehouse for 12 hours a day moving boxes sweating through all the pairs of clothes yes i owned that was the worst this is still pretty good by comparison so i completely agree that when you find a level of success after having struggled to get it you're generally much more appreciative of having it yeah for sure um so when it comes to your actual quality of video making like you said to begin with you were making old school runescape skits with a friend on a separate channel um so did you have any inspiration from other content creators uh like how did you improve yourself um when it came to the creation and the quality of your videos so when i was just making those skits it's gonna sound strange but i didn't really watch much youtube at all i would watch tv and i would watch films and i would want to try and replicate that and make that i think a lot of my inspiration came from tv shows and films i only really started to consume youtube as almost a replacement for television and a replacement for films maybe a year or two after i started putting videos out onto it but then i discovered the youtube reviewers that i admired i mean one of my earliest and most consistent uh, YouTubers I admired for their content was Pro Jared, and Pro Jared made a lot of uh, classic reviews on N64 games, PlayStation 1 games, NES games, SNES games. Uh, slight side tangent, I actually messaged Pro Jared about a year or two ago, just saying, hey man, just want to say I really like your stuff. And now me and him actually talk quite often about making videos and working together, and he's a genuinely decent dude. And then we would look into things like Total Biscuit, who would really focus on game reviews and then we had a brief run of a tv show in the uk called games master that tried really hard to be hip and cool and down with the kids that was you could tell it was extremely corporate but i think a lot of my inspirations for making videos it's going to sound really strange but when you spend a hell of a lot of time making the content you don't have a lot of time to consume or watch other content yeah. so i would only google or search for videos that i really cared about i wanted a review of this game and i would find zero punctuation so i learned okay you don't need to have an hour-long review you can be a really short three four minute snappy comedy review but then i also found people that would go super in depth and write massive wikipedia articles about stuff and i tried to just combine those two together to be honest my actual video editing is extremely basic 
I use a, a free program called Shotcut and I record on the free version of OBS. I don't do anything complex in my videos. I just write down my experience, record it, and put it up and then move on to the next. And I've seen a lot of YouTubers rise up in the last maybe seven or eight years who are doing the same thing, and I admire each and every one of them for putting the effort in to do it. Sometimes I'll see someone doing something and steal it. Like I stole Pro Jared's idea of always wearing a shirt. The reason I always wear the white shirt and the waistcoat he was doing it. I'll take that. That works for him. Then I stole the titles from um, Team Triple Jump. Nice. And then the the out of random out of 10 scores at the end, that was also taken from Pro Jared. A lot of the RuneScape stuff was taken from Settled. I just see these amazing content creators and I'm like, okay, I'm going to steal what you're doing. Just out of British <laughs> accent. Now it's mine. <laughs> yeah. But, th but to give yourself more credit there, because if you just crack out a video, which obviously that's not how you mm. uh, ran it down, but it, simplistically, your comedic timing is fantastic. I, I don't know if you got, you know who Dunkey is? He makes... Yeah, again, Dunkey yes, is beautiful. He's here. His, yeah, his Dark Souls 3 plunging attack is still one of my absolute favorite <laughs> repeated pullbacks to a joke in a video. That shows an understanding of the rule of three, an understanding of comedic timing, an understanding of flashbacks and stuff. One of the, I'm really glad you brought up Dunkey because the guy is just an absolute genius with writing. One of the aspects of learning acting within my degree was you have to learn about the structure of jokes and you have the structure mm -hmm. of humor. And there's an old saying, dissecting a joke is like dissecting a frog. It helps you understand how it works, but it also kills it. So mm -hmm. one of the weird things is I do understand the process of exactly how you set up a joke, hit the punchline, move on. But sometimes by doing it, to me, it's almost quite formulaic. Like, I'll be sat there watching a comedian who'll say something really funny. Instead of laughing, I'll be like, it was a terrific formulation. Very good setup. <laughs> very good punchline. Yes. Well, I, I feel that. Structure. <laughs> but you, you're, yeah. you're, the way you do it, though, is like a long format donkey video. It's super informative. And then every once in a while, he'll just catch me off guard. I'll be like, that's amazing. And I feel like as a gamer, it's only something i would understand too if you show this to anybody else you're not gonna you might find it somewhat comedic but as a gamer you mm. just fall in love you with get the it, way yeah. you make you the video it. yeah it's those so. and that's that is actually a really interesting and a really important thing you've hit there there's the idea of the in group and the out group and whenever you have in group jokes only the people within that group understand them like if you walk up to it, there's a weird thing because I played RuneScape for so long. Anytime I'm at a Christmas party and I see someone pull a Christmas cracker, I wince. Part of me inside hurts. And I'm like, <laughs> you've just ruined it. That was worth so much. You've not yeah. even got a blue party hat. You've wasted that. Go back in time. Don't do it. Like I see people wearing party hats at Christmas parties. I walk in, I'm like, holy crap, everyone's a billionaire. Like part of my brain still does that. But if, if I were to say that same line to a group of people who don't play RuneScape, no one knows what I'm on about. So having those in-jokes is super important. It's got to be MMORPG related. It's got to be Warhammer 40k related. It's going to be Magic the Gathering related. And by doing that, it's almost this subconscious message that the person watching the video understands I'm in that group and I love it and I'm creating content for the people in that group. You can always yeah. tell when someone isn't because you get that very corporate, very fake. Exactly. It's like when politicians try and imitate memes or mm -hmm. when someone who's really high up in a company or a CEO just walks out and says the catchphrase of the week. They've been scrolling through funny junk or whatever. They want to try and find something specific for that. You know, they've they've been trolling Newgrounds for the latest Flash game and they want to just note down they played it. <laughs> Newgrounds. <laughs> oh, yeah. Newgrounds, man. I missed that. <laughs> well, you can tell it's fake. You can tell when someone yeah. isn't being genuine with this. Now, here's a great example. One of my, my friends is a comedian called John Robertson who does an incredible show called The Dark Room. I don't know if you guys have yep. watched The Dark Room or been to it before. I, I, I've been to it twice. Yeah, I know You've exactly. You've been to it twice? Yeah, yeah. How good is The Dark Room, man? It's amazing. Well, yeah. John actually did The Dark Room at RuneFest one year. And John understands as a comedian the importance of the in-group jokes to... Sh to show that you're not mocking, you're actually almost paying homage to it. So John spent ages, not as a RuneScape player, learning RuneScape lore. He learned all oh, of wow. the in-jokes, all the out-jokes. He, he studied all the history of it, and he made jokes relating to Rune Scimitars, relating to Party Hats, relating to Neve and Steve, that kind of stuff. And I think that's what the kind of in-joke humor is about. You can tell that if someone understands 
the subject matter to such a degree that they can make in-jokes, they're not standing outside mocking. They're standing on the inside of it, almost satirising their own hobby, almost gently joking and poking fun at themselves. And I think one of the biggest... If I'm going on too long about this, lads, please oh, stop go, me, because this go, is just go. my absolute passion to discuss go the technical it, aspect of creation. I'm learning a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. so I love that. One of the <laughs> biggest aspects I can tell is, have you seen the IT crowd? Yeah. Have you seen the Big oh, Bang like the... Theory? Yeah. yeah. The IT crowd, to me, is a show about nerd subculture that makes jokes from within almost satirizing the subculture, but you can tell it's from a place of love because the jokes are so specific, they have to be from a place of love. There has to be knowledge there. Then you look at the Big Bang Theory, and that is making jokes about nerd subculture from the outside, mocking in, because the jokes are actually not correct. There was an example once where they were playing, I think they were all sat around on the laptops in the Big Bang Theory playing World of Warcraft, and one of them suddenly just says, yes, I have the Sword of Azeroth from a drop, which, okay, that's not in the game. As a person outside watching it, I can see what the joke is. It's tried to construct, oh, they've got a red, a red drop. From being within that circle, I actually know the red drop that you've referenced is incorrect. And then they say, to eBay! Okay, that's again yeah. not how that works yeah. specifically. I can see that if you're outside that circle, the joke formulation is correct. If you're inside the circle, it makes no sense. And then there's a few seconds of silence, and then one of the other characters in the room then goes, yes, now I have the Sword of Azeroth. The joke is that he sold it to that person, sure. and everyone watching outside is like, oh, what a great joke. And everyone who actually understands the culture is going, no, none of this is how this works. eBay's not that fast. Yeah. You know yeah. what? Th this conversation actually is like bang on with a conversation I had with my granddad uh, a few months ago. And um, we were just having a general discussion about movies and, you know, I, I'm getting older and I find a lot of movies that come out nowadays, I don't enjoy them as much as I used to. And it, it bums me out a little bit, to be honest. I try to go into it open-minded. And, um, you know, he, he, he spoke to me about this film that he saw a few years ago that he watched with my grandma. And it was from a time period way back in the past when he was alive. And um, he said, going into the movie in the very first scene, the dress that the lady was wearing was not a true representation of what they would have wore back then. And from that moment at the start, they weren't able yeah. to take the move. They weren't able to take it seriously. Like it was, they, they watched it, but they knew that the people who had made it didn't quite Perfect grasp example. it. Because then you can tell that this has not been made with love for the subject matter. It's been made as product to make money when you yeah. see something that's made with love for the subject matter and knowledge of the subject matter and a genuine point of passion then it comes across i mean there's a great example in um, the tarantino film inglorious bastards i don't know if you guys have seen that before but back oh, in course. world war ii the english would hold up their fingers like this and the germans would hold their fingers like this to show the number three and there's actually a plot point in the film where there's a spy having dinner with a lot of German officers and he tries to order three drinks and he orders like that. And then he kind of looks down and everyone looks really scared. And you can see that all right. of the other officers are just that. staring at him. And that is because that is an exact historical use of the correct kind of physical terminology there, the physiology, to, to make a plot point. When you watch a film that gets all of this wrong, you're just pulled out of it and you're like... People say, oh, just turn your brain off and enjoy it. No, I don't want to have to turn my brain off and enjoy it because there's so yeah. much good art out there that I should be able to engage my brain and see the people who have made this have made this with me in mind. So whenever I'm sitting writing a script and I'm thinking, right, I've got to make a joke here and I've got to make it about something nerdy. Well, that's good because I am something nerdy and I can specifically reference. I mean, the cup that I'm using right now is the cup that I stole from Jagex. It's got the Jagex logo <laughs> on the side of it. And if Jagex aren't happy with that, next to me, because I haven't bothered cleaning up, is the other Jagex cup that I stole from them as well. <laughs> my, my jokes come from a point of love of this subculture because I've been in this subculture and for so long and I want to keep being in it. So yeah. I'm really glad people are picking up on those. I, I think sometimes in the old school RuneScape, 
uh, community, it can be a little bit, a little bit challenging in some ways because, from my experience, most people who play old school RuneScape just play old school RuneScape. So mm -hmm. it's like, you know, sometimes yeah. if you throw something in there that's gaming related, like you take something from Warhammer 40k or whatever, it's like a lot of people are just gonna be like, don't know what that is. Back on with the video, do you know? So it's like. I, I that's something that i've recently tried i've been trying to get better at putting things into my into my videos that is very relatable to my audience um mm. and it, it's it's a challenge for me because i feel like the old school runescape community are you know so focused on old school which i guess is a challenge but it's also an easy way of doing it um something that i've done recently is like i know my general audience are around the same age as me like between the age of 25 to like mid 30s and I know that a lot of those people would have grown up with the same shows as me, the same films, etc. So I've started to try and implement like funny short clips from really good movies that I've enjoyed and loved. Uh, like recently, I put a clip in from um, No Country for is it No Country for Old Men? Country for Old Men, yeah. From that one, uh, from Rush Hour, just like really funny, oh, silly little things, just like yeah. to just yeah. put in there and just change where the story's going. And um, so, so far it's done well, but you are in a completely different category. Like, I was thinking about this before the podcast, and I was thinking, what exactly is Josh Strife Hayes? Like, you're obviously a critiquer, you critique things, you review MMOs. Have you ever been, have you ever been called a historian? Because I feel like at this point you almost are, because you review the old MMOs that, like, nobody plays now. So I actually had a series where I wanted to go back and discover the history of the MMORPG, and I went all the way back, and I think I've only made about five episodes of this, because it did not do well, because I didn't put a lot of humor into it, it was purely informational, but I made about five episodes, went all the way back to the one of the very first video games, effectively, which I think was called Line War, which was uh, the first LAN-connected PCs, it was this first-person shooter made of vector art that was all put together, and then the first online RPG, which I think was the Island of Kesmai, and then we come into George Lucas's Habitat, which was this kind of online game that you could exist within, and then finally we push into things like Ultima Online and EverQuest, when they actually came out with their online modes. But this is going back to when MMORPGs, you paid per 15 minutes of internet. So these were extremely expensive to play, very, very slow. And I mean, The Realms of Future Past was a title that I will never forget that was just like a mud, the multi-user dungeons or the, the text-based ones. And then when I played through Otherland, when I found that, I made an entire series of trying to play through this wildly weird dead MMORPG based on the Tad William novels of Otherland. And I got to the end of the game before the game effectively shut down. There's a lot of history with that. And I would say that a lot of these games that I've been making videos on, because they're now shut down, my videos are some of the few remaining kind of digital artifacts where people can watch these virtual worlds. People blame me for the death of Terra, which was very funny because I put a video out on Terra. Terra died. I put a video out on... Oh, God. I think <laughs> made about... no, Wait, tell us the story on yeah. that. What, well, I've deal? made about 70 episodes now of the worst MMO ever series, and about I went back about 50 of the games I've covered have now shut down. Oh my so, god. <laughs> and I'd like to, I mean, obviously it's not my fault, but I will take personal blame for all of them, every single one of them. And people go, oh, when I cover this game, it's going to shut down. When I cover that game, it's just down. But I'm covering games that are going to shut down anyway, eventually. But when you say historian, I don't approach it with the intent of creating a historical artifact. I approach it with the intent of enjoying it as a game, as live as it is. And if it happens to then you know, die and my video survives, that does become an artifact. And this is looking into one of my favorite YouTubers, Accursed Farms, Ross, who does his Game Dungeon series. He plays a lot of old MS-DOS games, a lot of old PC games, and he's a big fan of maintaining gaming media after its death and this is a, a huge debate that's going on in the gaming world and i'm very much on the side of if a company have a choice between destroying the actual source code of a video game they've got because they can't sell it anymore or don't want to maintain an online server or just releasing the source code to the public and saying here you go have fun with it i would much rather they release the source code because there are so many online games that have shut down, but the companies don't want to give away their code, so you can now never play them again. 
which is a real shame. We're losing gaming media. Mm. So I don't approach it as a historian, but I can understand that sometimes, every now and again, something I make will end up having historical value, for better or worse. Yeah. And I mean, I think the majority of stuff down the line, maybe even sooner than that, will have historical value. Uh, Rakesy, <laughs> I love that comment, though. Like, he is a historian. It's so weird when you go to a museum and you see an N64 or a GameCube. <laughs> And you're like, what the hell? I grew up playing that, and now it's in a museum. Nothing to make you we, feel old, isn't it, when you're someone gives you an original Game Boy, like, and you're like, oh, yeah, this came out, like, what, five years ago? <laughs> oh, no, no. No, it did not. It's a collectible wait, now. It's in, like, wait, a wait, case. You're saying, you're saying it, you saw one in a museum, or you're going to... No, gonna they're in a museum. I didn't see it, but I saw it uh, on a picture, and they Dude. had it up keep, in auction. But we lived through the birth... Mm. of of gaming like the very creation i guess we missed that on pong right yeah, it was there in the operation room uh, I, <laughs> this I, is actually a really I've interesting point about oh, these right oh, oh, beautiful oh, no. don't get him started on pokemon yeah. cards he will grab well, fu funny spread. funny story this is the sega mega drive and oh when i was growing up we oh. really wanted to get the nintendo 64 that came out we were really okay. young and um, at the time, my parents couldn't afford to, to buy us the N64. And instead, my my uncle at the time, which I didn't know of, donated his Sega Mega Drive. We knew nothing. So we just played it and we were like, oh my God, this is amazing. We can play Aladdin. <laughs> it's sick. Like, Aladdin. <laughs> so I had the, the Master System, which was, I think, the, the UK. We got like one console before. I don't know if it's the previous generation, but I had the Master System, and then my friend had the Mega Drive. I went, you've got, and I was always so jealous. It was just such a cool <laughs> thing. But, but this actually cool. links this, this links back really nicely to when you said about the films that we grew up with, because we are in that kind of twenty-five to thirty-five demographic. With the worldwide spread of the internet now, and I know that I'm going to sound like an absolute boomer saying this, but it is going somewhere, believe me. With the worldwide spread of the internet now, every single person globally has access to almost all media immediately, which means that. Our attention is spread so wide over everything we could possibly have. There are all the games, all the films, all the books, all the time. But when media was harder to acquire, such as you either had to go to a video store and rent it, or wait for it to be on TV, or go and see it in the cinema, or video games were slightly more expensive and you had to go to a shop and physically buy them, what we had was a lot of the kind of geek culture was almost centralised going down a very similar path. So a lot of us did play Ocarina of Time. A lot of us played Tomb Raider on the PlayStation. A lot of us played this. Our demographic in general, our kind of age range, has a similar early, I suppose, early game, if you will, of experiencing geek culture, which gives us all these shared collective memories. So jokes make sense because we all watch the same films, we all read the same books, we all play the same games. Now, because I used to teach in schools, the only games that almost all the kids will have collectively as a shared memory are games that are free and involve all of them. So in 20 years' time now, it's going to be jokes about Fortnite. Yeah. It's going to be jokes about Apex Legends. It's going to be jokes about Fall Guys. It's going to be jokes about uh, Vampire Survivors, things like that. But we had a very kind of close-knit, similar early experience of geek culture. It's going mm. to be much harder in 20 or 30 years' time to find anything that every geek kind of experienced together yeah that's a really good point we've gotten more geeks over the years <laughs> it's it's, it's yeah, just, gaming, yeah. just as a business gaming yeah. might be one of the most ferocious other than ai right that's coming out right now it just keeps growing it's mag esports mm. in 20 years I think the whole yeah nerd, be joking on Fortnite, i think the whole but... nerd related like you know culture right whether it's media like could be games shows or whatever mm -hmm. i think that's just like become very mm -hmm. mainstream now so mm -hmm. and i've yeah. like i've definitely seen the evolution of like how because it got so popular there's you know i guess this, this is like a different conversation but it's just like corporate like you mentioned right like how like because it's gotten so called uh, popular a lot of the the corporate interests nowadays you can feel it you know spread into the into this culture so yeah. and you know when you look at corporate interests is we could oh man the amount of stuff that irritates me for that because yeah. from one point you know, we're all intelligent guys if you were in charge of a business clearly you want to maximize profits but that sometimes is at odds with 
making the best possible game. I very much enjoy Dead Space. I very much enjoy Dead Space 2 because I think they came from a point of passion and wanting to make the best possible game. Does anyone play Dead Space 3? Because you can just buy the best gun in the game for real cash from a console in the game. Because when the success of Dead Space 1 and 2 kind of showed that there is a, a franchise here, they said, right, let's milk it. Let's go for this. Corporate interest within geek culture is something that will immediately change it from being created for the in-group to created for absolutely everyone. And that sounds super positive. Everyone can experience this. It is in one way. But another way, it's everyone can experience this if you pay enough. Yeah. Pay more. Buy more. Corporate changes in video games are ridiculous. I mean, we look into the fact that Silent Hill is now just a gacha game in Japan. It's one of those physical, actual machines that go for it. You can see yeah. the changes in RuneScape 3. RuneScape 3 is the bastion that's holding it back against old school RuneScape. And as soon as the... I, I hope, yeah. I truly hope, the investors in Jagex just don't know old school RuneScape exists. <laughs> that's what it is. Like, yeah. as soon as they walk into the Jagex office, it's almost like that scene in the first Matilda film, you know, where the classroom just flips around and goes from being fun to just really boring. As soon as the investors walk into the Jagex office, everyone's like, crap, quick, change it. Everyone goes to RuneScape 3 and no one talks about it. Because <laughs> as soon as the investors uh, get a whiff of it, they're like, why aren't we monetizing this better? Do, do you know what? Yeah. So, yeah. I, I'm. This conversation has been so perfect because all of the notes I've written have like just and just been touched on. This is like, I was going to ask you some questions on this because you have a super unique position actually. And you, you probably know more than I do. I dabbled a little bit in RuneScape free, but you've explored it. Uh, and you've obviously explored old school RuneScape as well. Um, so there's been a lot of, I, I guess you would say like fear and news that has come out recently where there's been a lot of drama with RuneScape 3, where people were, you know, finally starting to quit. But this has been going on for years, so I don't know how serious this is. Um, and it's one of those things, though, that it's always played on my mind in a way, because RuneScape 3, in a lot of ways, for Jagex, which is, RuneScape 3 is like the sister company, I guess, of old school, but it's all under the same roof. It's always been like their personal piggy bank. It's like, mm -hmm. sure, it's got less players, it's less popular, but you can spend as much money on it as you want. And they're obviously making a good chunk of money from it. Whereas old school RuneScape, as far as MTX goes, I mean, we've got bonds, right? That, that, that's as far as it goes. You can have an opinion on that. You can like it or dislike it, whatever. Um, but, you know, do you think that if RuneScape 3 were to ever shrink to the point where it was just not profitable anymore, do you think that us, as the old school RuneScape community, would have a lot to worry about? Is this something we should be concerned for? Because in a lot of ways, whenever I see people playing RuneScape 3, I'm just like, mm. these guys are legends. These guys yeah. are keeping old school RuneScape going the way it is, and I want that to continue. <laughs> They're taking the yeah, bullet. Well, <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah. The tanks. Yeah. So Jagex have been... I mean, I've worked with Jagex professionally before. I made a video reviewing the RuneScape 3 client on mobile, which I still think is one of the best mobile games available. Old School RuneScape and RuneScape 3 on mobile are definitely the top when it comes to mobile MMORPGs. And I went to the Jagex offices to critique Necromancy before it came out. I had a couple of concerns about that, which they did genuinely address, to be fair to them. As a business, it would be foolish of us. I mean, this isn't financial advice. I don't know what Jagex are planning to do. All I can say is that my experience with the RuneScape 3 team has been very positive as people. They're lovely people. As a business, they would be foolish to not at least consider the impact of it. But that consideration has to be both short-term and long-term. And the reason so many businesses fail in the long term is because they only consider the short term. You look at the quarterly returns, quarterly returns, make them higher quarterly returns. Yeah. And there is a theory in and of any kind of retail or shopping thing where at the end of the year or at the end of the quarter, if you want to really maximize your profits, you can sell all the shop fittings if you want to. You can sell the till. You can sell the shelves. You can sell the carpet. You can sell everything. <laughs> you can fire all your staff. And then at the end of the year, your you know year report looks bloody amazing so much money so little overhead then the next year starts and you realize ah crap what i was actually doing was borrowing money from the future yeah. in order to make this bigger now and i had this discussion with chris wilson from path of exile and i said do you believe that there are effectively goodwill player goodwill is a currency 
That's what it is. You build up player goodwill, and then if you need to make a decision as a company the players hate, you have to understand you are spending player goodwill. And eventually, if you spend enough player goodwill, the stuff that you haven't banked already, you're going to have to get that player goodwill from somewhere, and that comes from the future, which means players will now hate you in the future, and therefore they will start to leave. So when RuneScape make a decision, they have to understand that Old School RuneScape, I think, right now has a lot of trust from the players. When Old School RuneScape makes a decision that the players aren't happy with and don't trust, they are spending that goodwill. When they make a decision the players like and respect, they are building it back up. RuneScape 3 is on that knife edge of goodwill. Every time they make a decision, if they're like, yeah, this is positive, you get a little bit. Then they go like, hey guys, hero pass. All gone. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, you know Everyone's about the hero pass. Everyone's like, no, 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 We also have to be willing... Oh god, the hero pass was just an absolute mess. We also have to be willing to vote with our wallets and actually make decisions that impact the company in a way they care about, which is only ever financial. And this is another thing that any operation has to care about. If you are going to make a decision that you know will affect your user base, you have to say, right, how many people are actually going to quit? Because mob mentality has about a two-month lifespan. That's just a statistically you know, visualized thing. If a company does something awful, people will hate them for two months. Then, provided the company is still giving them the service that's at least somewhat close to what they want, yeah. they'll just come back to it. Blizzard did exactly the same thing. Everyone boycotted Blizzard. Boycott Blizzard, which means take a two-month break and then come back when the next cinematic drops. That's what it is. As everyone hates everything until two months has passed, we don't care anymore, and then we go back and do the thing. So RuneScape 3, milking themselves and making a load of money, even though they're spending player goodwill, they know there's roughly a two-month lifespan. We've seen a lot of content creators move from RuneScape 3 over to old-school RuneScape. Will they start to milk old-school RuneScape? Well, they have to weigh this up. They have to weigh up how much player goodwill is banked and how much is going to be spent for a bad decision. Do they want to keep making good decisions to bank up some more player goodwill? And when they make a bad decision, it will affect them, you know, monumentally for two months. And then they'll start to see the stabilized numbers come back. If the amount of money that they could gain in a terrible decision, a terrible monetized decision, is so great that it would outweigh a relatively significant two-month boycott, then it would be a good business decision to make. If you've seen the film Fight Club, at the very start, the narrator, Jack, people refer to him as, discusses his job. You guys seen Fight Club at all? Yeah, yeah. So Jack, just for anyone who watching this who hasn't seen it, Jack discusses his job. He is an insurance adjuster. He basically works out the chance of a car failing the average insurance payout for someone driving that car and then how much it will cost to do a recall of that car. If the amount that the company would have to pay out given all the accidents is less than the cost of a recall for all of that car, they don't do a recall because they know financially it's a best decision to not do that. Mm -hmm. So Jagex are in a position where they have to discover, uh, discuss and think through every single financial decision not just in the long term or short term, but based on how addictive all the player bases are, based on the two month kind of care, based on how much player trust they've got banked. We'd yeah. be fools to think they're not doing it because we say don't do it. They're not yeah. doing it because right now the numbers don't match up. Yeah, I, they're hope. definitely doing cost benefit analysis, like for sure. Yeah. I heard though that Pretend. they might be traded very soon. This is just all hearsay, <laughs> but it's a traded Chinese company. So we call them the Chinese overlords. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of botting going on in RuneScape right now. And so if I was going to trade a company yeah. and I wanted to inflate the amount of players, again, this is all exactly. hearsay, this is yeah. not legal at all. But if I was going to trade a company, I'd want to increase the amount of botting to show that the amount of players that I have my game has is much, much higher. And then I'd yeah. do that thing where I talked about the shops where you sell off all of the... It's effectively a fire sale of all of your essential infrastructure just so your end-of-year report looks great. And what you mm -hmm. hope is that whoever buys you doesn't say hey, this seems like it's really high. Where did all this money come from? And then you don't have to explain, oh yeah, we sold off all the stuff that's going to make a load of money for you. You hope that you inflate the final year and then you move on. And this is what a lot of CEOs do because CEOs tend to have golden parachutes when it comes to these companies. Let's say that you go to a company, you make a load of terrible short-term decisions for the long-term, as in they make a crap load of money short-term, but they're going to tank your product in the long-term. 
You make those decisions, you make a load of money, and then you, in charge, quit. And then the product obviously goes down. You can then go to any other company and you can say, well, while I was in charge, it was doing great. And then when I left, mm. it was terrible. You don't sure. tell them that it's terrible because of the decisions you made before you left. You just say that while you were in charge, it was making loads oh, yeah. of money. They yeah. then hire you. You make short-term decisions which make a load of money, and then you move on to the next one. Because all people right. care about is quarterly returns. Th this conversation Absolutely. terrifies me. Like, it actually, like, genuinely it makes should. me fearful. As a person but, who does mainstream old school RuneScape content, yeah, you should be but very terrified. I, right I, the thing is, I have a lot of belief, and I feel like I've been in the old school RuneScape community now since its birth and since before. I was here when old school RuneScape was literally born because the people at Jagex didn't listen to the player. And then, as a consequence of that, lots of people quit. They voted with their wallets, and then Jagex said, Oh, look, we do have a 2007 backup on a hard drive. Let's <laughs> boot this bad boy back up. Who's interested? So, you know, I, I have a lot of faith in the community as a whole that if they were to start going down the MTX route, I, I think that people would genuinely stand up and they would, you know, they they'd pay with their wallets and, you know, or vote with their wallets, sorry. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. And I also think that in some ways it, it's scary when you talk about you know the ceo trying to get a good cv effectively but with mm -hmm. the company being traded every few years like mm -hmm. at the end of the day a company's gonna say they buy jagex and they hold it for two years at the end of those two years they want to make money right so obviously they're incentivized to listen to the people who know the game the j mods who are there that are actually in the community they're listening to what they have to say. And from what I've heard from conversations I've had with those JMods, they've always just said they trust us to make the best decision possible, is what the JMods have actually said. Yeah. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, I don't really see any of the JMods thinking that putting MTX into old school RuneScape would be a good idea. But at the same time, you know, if the, the owners of Jagex said, no, we really want to inflate those numbers and we want to sell this company for a lot more than what we bought it for. It could happen, but like, I don't know. Maybe I'm just too optimistic. I, I don't no, think it you, would. You have to be, be a fool if you didn't think about that. Those things. Okay, so this is a really weird thing. Have you ever heard of a thing called Call of the Void? This is going somewhere, trust me. Call of the Void is the idea that if you're on the top of a really high building, part of your brain goes, hey, jump off. <laughs> and then if you're standing by a lake void. part of your brain goes hey throw your phone in and you're thinking why the hell are you doing this brain why are you thinking about this and what this is it's a really weird sign of intelligence whenever you're in any situation your brain has to process every possible scenario that could happen in that situation and then for some reason you pick out all the really weird ones it's a sign that you are processing all of the potential outcomes so when you're sat there looking at the game you love made by a company that you trust, for now, we have to say, right, let's look at all the potential outcomes because it would be foolish of us if we didn't. Now, every single JMod that I've ever met has been game first, game focused. Yeah. They don't even care about making the most money. They want to make the best game. And I think that's why they're there. I think that's exactly why they've got the job. Every JMod I've been lucky enough to spend time with is just so, so bloody passionate about RuneScape. It's insane. I mean, whenever I meet a lot, anyone that makes video games, they're built different. They're just so passionate about video games. They don't stop talking about video games, which is amazing. They're the people that you want making it. But we do also need to understand that above them are lots of business people making lots of business decisions who are not necessarily video game players. We saw this with... and. You said that you think that people will vote with their wallets. We actually have a precedent in World of Warcraft when they added in the WoW token, when they added in a load of different shops, when they added in things that you can buy and progress. People did boycott it for about two months and then came back. And then they went, hey, guys, quick, release Classic, release Classic Plus, release this, release that, release the other. These are the, the kind of break in case of emergency glass cases they've got. We'd be foolish to think that Jagex don't have another one of those. I mean, I've just been playing EverQuest for a hell of a lot to make a video review on EverQuest. They have something called progression servers. Every six months, EverQuest, which has 30 expansions and is still going, everyone's at endgame by now. Early game, no one there. Just, it's absolute barren. But every six months, they release a progression server, which is just vanilla EverQuest. And then every few weeks, 
another expansion gets added onto this, and everyone plays the progression server. Because it's fun to have everyone there together, moving up, and then a new progression server. Everyone goes back, it's fun, everyone moves up. EverQuest know if they keep doing that, they'll keep making money. Jagex will have methods that they know will make money but they won't do them until they have enough player goodwill or enough need to do them. We'd be foolish to think otherwise. I, I completely Damn. agree, <laughs> but it's always on the yeah. top of my mind. And, you know, fun question. If it does get sold, Josh, who do you think would be best to own Jagex? Who do I think would be best to own it if yeah. we had to sell it? I don't think I could buy it. I don't right now. I don't think I've got the <laughs> capital behind me to walk up and buy Crowd it. Fun, you know? <laughs> We'd have to look in. So, I mean, <laughs> my brain is a joke. Just straight away says Game Ago. But no, don't, don't sell it to Game Ago. I think we'd have to look at what company have consistently produced a game that listens to its players. And as weird as it is, Jagex is pretty much at the top of there. Jagex know how to listen to their players. I would give them as a really good example. I, I wouldn't want to sell it to to blizzard particularly no the only yeah, person the only no, person no, have no. a real sort of no, personal no. connection with would be chris wilson from grinding gear games uh, the guys that make path of exile they make decisions some are good some are bad they've made a successful enough game for it to carry on and they at least do listen to the player base and they seem to put on some pretty good shows every now and again but apart from that what do you guys think any kind of game company you think that have made successful continuous games. Whoever the hell made Vampire Survivors, just give them RuneScape and be like, there you go, have fun. You know, I personally, personally, I think they should just own themselves, but I don't think that's financially no. viable. But if, if yeah. in theory, they could self-sustain themselves, I think it'd be better if they did that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I cool think they could do like an IPO where everybody in the community gets to buy a share and then like crowdfund. But oh, that look would at that be dog, a man. massive crowdfund though. So probably Wait, my dog won't leave me alone until I pick her up. <laughs> oh, what's her name? Her name is Piper. Uh, she sees me as a large, terrible dog, and needs to feel that she is taking care of me all the time. She she will mother me constantly. She does not believe that I am capable of cleaning myself, groom myself, or taking care of myself. So there's a little <laughs> bed under the desk. So whenever I am uh, whenever I'm working, I'll just sit there. Never again. Every now and again, I'll feel a little poor just tap at my foot or mm -hmm. tap at my face and she'll be like hey hey food food now <laughs> oh thank you man yeah i think best case scenario for buying back the game would be the gower brothers but that's not gonna happen oh. um i i, I don't think they would. selling it right I yeah think they it. i i think they did man that was at a rune fest um one of the gower brothers was on the screen and yeah <laughs> he was basically say saying how he wished he never sold it and he had remorse for selling it um after that I think for me personally, I think the, I don't know who the owners of EVE Online are, but I really like what EVE Online have done in terms of their game and how long it's been going for. Yeah. Um, and then I guess after that, if you want to look at a company that I believe has had major success and makes good games, has a slightly toxic community, would probably be, uh, be Riot. But then again, we'd get a bunch of oh, skins no. and MTX <laughs> in the game, so... Yeah, right. isn't, isn't uh, Riot making their own MMO? So yes. Like, nah, we don't need oh, you. Oh, dude, they absolutely <laughs> are, and I can't wait for it, man. I've been waiting for Riot's MMO to come out now for years, and I, I've got... I've got high hopes and expectations. What, what Josh, I, I take it you follow you follow that yourself. So So I watched all of Arcane, which was phenomenal. Uh, one of the best yeah. TV shows without a doubt. And then I listened to the song by Miracle of Sound. Again, absolutely beautiful song, song called Perfect. I don't know if you guys listen to Miracle of Sound at all, but he makes video game based music. It's really, really cool. I think that they've got a huge amount of potential for an MMORPG. And I think I've been following a couple of the Twitter stuff, and one of the guys involved said that the biggest mistake they've made so far was announcing that they're doing anything. Not because they're not doing it, because anyone within the, the creative industry... You know how there's a two-month period of anger? Well, hype has about a three-year lifespan. The moment you release hype, even just a single poster, just an idea, just a trailer... Three years from the first thing is when hype is at fever pitch. That's when you want to release your product. Three years from the first mention, boom, here's the product. It will sell off the shelves immediately. I think they understand that it's slightly more than three years away. 
and yeah. it's very very difficult to mitigate that hype it's very difficult to mitigate and control expectations you can't really keep someone hyped up for like five six seven years for something you want to release the very first hey we're doing this and then three years later it's done even if it took you 10 yeah that's that's kind of the same with like ashes of creation i, I was so oh. excited for that like a year ago and now i'm just yeah. like what's that game yeah. called again that's supposed to be good yeah. <laughs> three years worth of hype you release something you say you're going to do it three years later here it is it's done that is the, the ideal amount of time to build up the ideal amount of expectations so the, the one thing i will say about the league mmo that's coming out is i i've kept up to date with it so i've seen the devs talking about it and one of the things that one of the key developers said um was the you know if this game doesn't come underneath the standard that riot would expect the game just won't come out and that for me was a massive boost in confidence i was like okay so either the game comes out and it's quality or it just doesn't and that's something i can live with um this is one of those examples where you can tell that a video game company and the people creating it are approaching it with a gamer first mindset you we all have to understand and accept there is going to be money and there's going to be corporate interests. But when the person kind of leading your ship, when the captain that's sailing toward the idea that he's got is a gamer, that's when you know, okay, when this ship arrives, it's going to be bloody good. The best example I can give recently is Baldur's Gate 3, because oh, yeah. I was lucky enough to be invited to the Baldur's Gate 3 launch event in I think, Belgium, in Ghent, Ghent in Belgium, and I met the the guy that's in charge of larian and you know what super nerd just absolute <laughs> ridiculous so so passionately nerdy everyone involved in that game and they even brought that game forward people didn't realize this but instead of pushing the game back and back and back they pushed it back once finished it and went yeah we're actually gonna bring the release forward by a month because it's ready i want you to have the game and i thought that's incredible most games wouldn't do that at all but whatever happens with the riot mmo if it's being driven by people who have a standard that is way above what gamers should expect and it's being driven by personal passion it's going to at least be enjoyable yeah i mean just just look at the stuff that riots made it's like you can say what you mm. like about league of legends and the community and stuff but mm. like the, pretty much everything that they've released that i know mm. of has effectively been a success their, their card game uh is it rune terror i think it's called their rune terror yeah tft uh arcane the anime it's like they're dipping their toes in everything and everything that they've yeah. done has actually been successful yeah. and um yeah I, I think that if that mmo does come out i'll definitely check it out absolutely and again the, the biggest danger that they've exposed themselves to already is the three-year hype cycle even if it's the best game ever if it comes out five or six years from now it's going to immediately be accused of it missed its hype cycle. Oh, when I mean the the best, the most toxic MMORPG community that I can think of is the subreddit r slash MMORPG because no one hates MMOs more than those guys. And they will immediately say, dead game, dead on arrival, dead on arrival, straight away, late, immediately, dead on arrival. Guys, it might be good. Let's just hope it's good. Yeah. So Speaking about toxic, what what do you think is the most toxic gaming community that you've tested? Because I know when you upload a video, you probably get a lot of comments that could be great. And then if you touch on some of those communities, they might not be so great. The most amount of email threats I got was from Final oh. Fantasy fourteen fans. Um, <laughs> Dang, all the Final weeps. Fantasy, yeah, great game. Fantastic game. That's uh, fantastic. This... This might just be a case of correlation not exactly equaling causation. Because Final Fantasy XIV is so bloody big, there are simply so many players of it, which means you're going to get a number of people who are slightly crazy within this community. So when I release a video on it and I get people emailing me terrible things, I'm not thinking, oh my god, the entire community is like this. I'm thinking, well, more people have seen this. Therefore, there are going to be a higher chance that weird people with nothing better to do have seen this uh, the only game that i tend to refuse to cover is eve online just because mm. i'm scared of the eve online community because yeah. they're, if you're <laughs> going to sit in front of a spreadsheet for like eight hours a day you can probably do whatever the hell you want so i'm just going to leave that I, I can't even i don't know if i could put enough time in to do a good fair eve review but apart from that it's mostly smaller communities that are not they're not evil people 
I think they're just, it's a combination of being sad and fed up that their game has died. So when I say, oh yeah, Mortal Online 1 isn't very good, I very much upset both of those players. And when they decide to then <laughs> yeah. email me and say, oh, you know, you, you don't get it because this, 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 it's perfect, it's this, it should be that instead. I think that is almost an outpouring of emotional upset that the game they have invested their time into didn't succeed the way they wanted it to. Yeah. And when we talk about toxicity within MMORPGs, we also need to think, at least consider, the idea that people play these games for a long time. They make them their life. I'm in a difficult position because I can't make one MMO my life if I want to cover all of them. I made an entire video about how it's difficult to cover lots of different MMOs. But when I make a video on a game, people don't understand that I'm not critiquing their life choices. I'm critiquing a product made by a company designed to create money. But yeah. people think I'm critiquing their life choices. And if I say, hey, you like this game and it's bad, what they hear is, you made the wrong life choice. Yeah. Yep, and that's much more emotional. I mean, that's an MMO in a nutshell. It's an investment. Yeah. And, you know, we're all, getting, we're all getting older. Time is becoming more precious. The last thing you want to hear is some YouTuber who's barely played your game talking smack on it. I, I could completely understand like where that toxicity would come from and where feelings would be hurt. Nobody wants their time wasted or f to feel like they've wasted their time on a game. Um, I think we've all been very fortunate because we're playing old school and up until this point and hopefully into the future, it's like continued to thrive, like it's doing well. Um, I, I remember I saw something a little while back and it was like the, the top 10 list of MMOs and MMOs that are kind of like on a um, upward trajectory. And I think Old School RuneScape was one of like three games or something that was actually continuing to go up, um, which is just crazy considering how old it is. And, you know, it, it's an ancient game. When someone game spends well. a lot of their time doing anything, it becomes part of their life, part of their personality. And when someone comes along and questions this, especially someone that you don't believe is part of the in-group because this goes back to the whole in-group out-group thing if someone from within it's almost like you're allowed to hate the city that you're from no one else is yeah. like if you say oh my god yeah that city absolute crap worst place in the world and someone else says yeah that is crap you're like you shut up about my city my city's great you're allowed to hate something that you're invested in but no one else is and i think old school runescape is one of the few communities where i've pointed out things and i've said yeah this is crap and the community have kind of collectively gone yeah yeah, that, that, that's right. That's fair. And <laughs> it's about finding the players who haven't made the success of the product part of their personality. You get the same thing with the console wars. You get people who are absolutely violently pro Xbox and violently pro PlayStation, and they make defending the multi-billion company a part of their personality. And if you say something bad about their favorite thing, you're wrong. Just be a gamer like the games. We all make bad decisions and invest our time into the wrong thing. I bought an Ouya when it came out. I bought the Game Track system. I thought Runes of Magic was going to be bigger than World of Warcraft. We all make mistakes every now and again. I played RuneScape 3 for a bit. Right? We've, we've all made some Struggle. mistakes. <laughs> but it's very, very difficult to step back and say, okay, you know what, that, mis that choice I made wasn't necessarily the, the winning side of you know, this debate. Now I can go and enjoy what something else is. But when you get people who have put so much of their time and so much of their energy into identifying with a certain subculture and that subculture starts to fail or starts to fade away, they, if anything, redouble their efforts to explain their subculture is better, it's stronger. The in-group is smaller, but my God, it's then much more intense. Yeah. Yeah, tribalism is hilarious on every, especially gaming, on every field. Speaking about dead games... Is there a game that's died that you were like, man, I really wish that was still up? For me, it would be Guns the Duel. I don't know if you guys played Guns the Duel. It's like a Korean. Yeah, yeah they did Guns the Duel two, uh, Guns the Duel two as a remake. Took out all of the skill, and it just died instantly. And now there might be a private server here and there, but it's yeah. nowhere near the same. To me, it would be Otherland from making the Otherland playthrough. I think there was just something beautiful and chaotic and insane about attempting to make an MMORPG within Unreal Engine that was not built to make the, the MMORPG experience at all. But the the level design was actually done by a guy called Nick Cusworth, and Nick went on to make Croc. He made Croc first. Oh, yeah. 
uh, the the crocodile game on PlayStation One. Then he made Otherland. I actually I messaged Nick and I'm like, hey Nick, can we talk about Otherland? He just replied, no thanks. <laughs> no, idea. <laughs> no idea what went on there. But you know what? Respect to him. Didn't bother pushing it. And that uh, that shut down. That was a real shame. But if we're talking about genres, not just MMORPGs, I really miss base building real-time strategy. That's just a mm. random thing that I loved as a kid, like StarCraft and Command and & Conquer and Supreme Commander, stuff like that. I miss base building real-time strategy. But MMORPGs specifically, I would say RuneScape Classic because it's a shame that it's not online anymore. Yeah, I think that even if there's no one playing it, it should have remained online as an artifact of RuneScape's history that you can log in and just walk around the world and see how things used to be. They did that with Guild Wars 1. Guild Wars 1 is still online. It's still one of the best MMORPGs available, even though it's more like an online cooperative RPG. But losing RuneScape Classic links back to the conversation earlier about how you will lose media if companies don't see a reason or a profit to keep it online. Yeah. Sadly, I, I, with Classic, I believe the main reason they took it down was because the bugs, it was so old that they would find bugs that could actually, I'm not a science guy or a tech guy, but do harsh damage to the actual like, yeah. old school. There was, there was like loads that. of stuff with it that was wrong. There, there were, for example, like people were holding things hostage. Like you could open up the crystal chest, which you do with a crystal key, and then it would never That's close hilarious. again. So like there was like no <laughs> glories in the game. It was the only way to get uncut dragon uh stones and like you could like lure mobs out of where they should be and like they'd never go back to that place and you never got logged out so people would just hold things yeah. hostage and ruin the game <laughs> and like i think so, yeah. my favorite one of the the um building escape old school was the nightmare zone and how the nightmare zone has a cow wandering around it and i asked one of the jmods why is there a cow wandering around the nightmare zone and they said, we have the ability to add on to the map, but not remove some of the NPC behavior that's already there. Oh, because wow. we don't know what else it links to, because it turns out that a lot of the systems oh. were built on systems. So if they take out the cow from the nightmare zone, they don't know what else will happen. Oh, God. So they just didn't. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> you know, oh, I didn't know that. That was the construction skill for a long time. They were like, we can't mess with it. Like, yeah, who knows what's going to happen in the game? Oh, man. But, but Mod Ash, you know, he he managed to, like, make the impossible possible. Like, he managed to, like, re um redesign, like, how to, you know, how to use the house, uh, like, interfaces. Mm -hmm. And it, like, made it so much better. And he didn't break the game. If, Ash if, deserves if Ash so much crazy. more for the amount of Twitter that he has to put up with. If I'm ever having a bad day, I will just scroll through whatever anyone has tagged Ash in on Twitter. <laughs> just the the fact that the That's man crazy. goes through it, all of that. God, he's an absolute hero. He he's must go through Twitter like a too. thousand. Like he yeah. must respond to a thousand tweets a day minimum for like the and last loves, few years. Loves it. <laughs> if you have a little bit of attitude, the best part is Ash will take the time to go through your profile. Find something really <laughs> dumb you tweeted and just come back at you so hard, no. so unexpected, and the ratio is oh almost outside of RuneScape right. likes. Two, he, three he thousand. Ratio one guy like last week, the, he got like a thousand likes on that tweet. Like his whole I, tweet, like the ratio yeah. tweet, it was so bad. It's funny. Oh my God. God. And this actually, this links. It, it's all connected when you look at it. This links the idea of player goodwill. You know, we were talking about player goodwill being banked. If Ash, if Mod Ash tweeted out, hey guys, this is going to sound like a risk, but we need to do it, a lot of people would be like, okay, we'll go with that, because Ash has spent time not only building himself up as a developer, but also as a personality. And he can use that goodwill from his personality to then make decisions that other people would be worried about. He effectively is almost coddling us in his arms as he says, don't worry, this, this is the correct choice. Like and very... Children. Yeah, very few game companies have that relatable personality, the face to the company. And that's one of the great goodwill things about Jagex. There's a lot of faces to the decisions that get made, and it humanizes a lot of the process. Yeah. You know what's crazy? If Mod Ash was like, hey, can I, uh, do you think I should just be like the president of Jagex? Like, <laughs> I think everyone would be like, yes. <laughs> in my head, Canon, he is. I just hope that he's in charge. That's the face for sure. I know, yeah. right? Gosh. Yeah, speaking of iconic JMOS, though, you know, like, I feel like Ash is probably the only one from the first few years of old school left. Mm. Yeah, because, like, you know, Mott Mackay, like, he's not, he's not with Jags anymore. 
and like reach got like booted a long time ago and a bunch of others just left of their own accord it's like he is literally the 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 pillar you know to old school like he he must remain yeah they, they, they need to, they need to have that man like you know ash has been there since the birth of the original game and he's followed all the way through and it's you know i i think having like you said he's genesis yeah ha having that pillar there i i imagine the other j mods probably run stuff by him and stuff and you know i imagine that he has an overall say on things coming into the game and such as i think he should um because he's definitely got that runesque touch and obviously the old school runescape team has kind of exploded since it opened up well like 10 years ago they started with yeah, i think four like or five j mods plus people now right yeah yeah 30 plus you would think that there five. would be more j mods than those who work on runescape 3 wrong it's it's yeah. weird because that's the cash cow so there's actually yeah. way more developers on on runescape it's definitely been one of the most successful MMORPGs, and I think it will continue to be for a long time, simply because for an MMORPG to remain successful, it needs to provide something that it does better than anyone else. And I think this is one of the reasons, I've been playing EverQuest a lot, as I said, one of the reasons that I'm discovering that EverQuest has not managed to keep up is every modern MMORPG we now have access to does something EverQuest does better. What does old school RuneScape do better than any other game? And I would say it does being a background game better than any other game. Just oh, being something on your absolutely. second monitor, clicking absolutely. through. I, I remember, vividly remember, being at RuneFest back in 2010, 2011. Did any of you guys go to RuneFest 2010 or 2011, the first or second one they ever did? No. I wish. Not no, the first I was one. not there for that. I, did I, go went, to one. <laughs> I went in cosplay, but almost no one else was in cosplay. I was dressed up in like Bandos armor that I made from cardboard myself. It was Dang. terrible. I'll find a picture of it somewhere. But when I was there at 2011, we sat down with a couple of JMods at the time and they said, guys, we've got this really cool idea. Okay. We're going to completely reboot the combat system. We're going to add in abilities. We're going to add in hot bars. We're going to add in reactions. We're going to add in interrupts. We're going to do all this. And almost everyone in the room just went, why? Because at the time, World of Warcraft was doing combat really well. And RuneScape was doing click and wait really well. That was its pretty its bread and butter. That's what people wanted from it. And then Evolution of Combat came out. We all know exactly how well that went. People left the game. And I think people left the game not necessarily because the Evolution of Combat was a bad idea, because what that did was it directly put RuneScape's combat in competition with other systems like that, which were doing it better. Yeah. When RuneScape was a click-and-wait game, it had to be compared to other click-and-wait games, which at the time was pretty much just Adventure Quest. And then they changed everything around. Now you have to say, okay, right, so we can no longer compare this with this. We now must compare this with this, and now you have lost, because this thing was better. Then Old School RuneScape came back out. We went back to being click and wait. Old School RuneScape will continue to survive, I hope, for many, many years because it provides that background gameplay better yep. than any other MMO. And, and do you know what the interesting thing is? It's like when, when you say it's a background game, it's amazing that you say that because it can be. And then at mm. the same time, it can be one of the most intense like oh, adrenaline no, rush that you'll ever have in your yeah. life where you're you're killing zuck and getting an infernal cape for the first time or or you're getting killed in the wilderness or you're pking somebody it's like it can be all of these different yeah, things Rick, Rick, see, how can you forget about the people that do point one tick skill manipulating you know <laughs> come on man like, their fingers oh, and God. their toes you know that, that's right? like... that, that's the that's the thing though with old school runescape that gives it such charm is like it is one of the only game it's like a relic of mmos at this point that has mm -hmm. been one of the only long-term successful and thriving mmos to continue that has these really cool systems in place where you can do stuff like that like you can two tick free tick like I, i'm not sure if you're too familiar with like the the really high intense skilling kind of like in old school running, runescape. You know, strats. Have you seen I that get stuff, the Josh? Behind it, I'm not particular. I can prayer flick pretty much, and I can tick That's eat good. at uh, Jad if I need to. But I've not done the kind of like the two tick teak log method kind of thing where you just have to make sure everything is absolutely perfect. Yeah. And that again was a, a great example of RuneScape's systems, players working out how it worked and then exploiting them. And what we're looking into now is the idea that the general gameplay is based around 
a massive percentage of the player base not doing that but then you give the extreme players the, the chance to do that a, an example that i would compare this to is when doom came out there were four difficulty levels for it and people were like this is too easy so then they added the fifth difficulty which was called nightmare mode nightmare mode described itself as this is unfair and for nightmare mode the developers went you know what people are going to be saying it's too easy no matter what Double all the enemies, make them fire way faster, give them hit scan weapons, change all the basic enemies to like demons, just kill the player. And players still finished it. Players still found a way to speed run through all of these levels because if you give players a challenge, they will overcome it. So, what I love about RuneScape is the vast majority of everything in RuneScape is made for a casual player to be able to access it, to be able to do it pretty okay, to be able to move on. But every now and again, you'll find something where they're like, hey, you won't be able to do this. There's no way you can kill Jad at level three. You can't do it. And then a player comes along and does it because the systems allow them to do it. And that's what's great about RuneScape. They haven't stopped you from trying. They've just said it's difficult to do. Yeah. So can I we completely about, agree. We could, we could totally talk about like the strengths of what uh, you know, old, old school RuneScape or just RuneScape has over other MMOs. Because I've played you know, a, a fair amount of MMOs over my lifespan. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, aside from, you know, I feel like the only thing we can ever compare RuneScape to other MMOs to, for the most part, is just the fact that, like, there's combat. Because I feel like pretty much almost every MMO I've ever played other than RuneScape, it's 90% all combat, right? They never really let you become, like, you know, just a mm -hmm. skiller, right? Someone that just can literally be happy spending years and years just training skills. Whereas all the other MMOs is like, you only have one way to go. You, you, you beat low level monsters you fight the bosses and then you get better gear and you fight better bosses right and that's kind of like or you fight other people i think that's it with most mmos whereas runescape's like you can you know do everything you want There's you have no action you have action online rpgs like well terror when it was around like um i want to say vindictus the just fighting combat stuff like that then you have just life skills which i think was palia that's just come out that's just about doing that runescape combines them both very well for an mmorpg to succeed it very much needs to find a core kind of critical mass of players and then roll over itself to keep this critical mass going because no matter how amazing your world is with combat and skillers if they are a two different demographics that have to support each other and exist symbiotically you need enough players on one side and enough players on the other so if we go back to the early kind of years of it i would say the greatest strength of runescape when you compare it to games like asheron's call everquest albion online and world of war that were out at the time the greatest strength was that it didn't need a download that was the earliest decision that allowed runescape to gain the critical mass of players that asheron's call failed to reach that everquest and albion would then be taken away from that world of warcraft did get but not necessarily at schools or libraries the fact you could play the game without downloading it but then your progress wasn't saved to your local machine like on uh, there's a game that did that i think it was sherwood dungeon it was saved to your actual account and then you could travel from place to place and play runescape wherever you wanted to that got it the critical mass now with you know, modern day pcs having a download or requiring a download is not necessarily a problem pretty much everything does so it's a moot point now but runescape came along at a time when and this links back to what we were saying earlier about culture within the mid 90s to the mid 2000s culture having a much smaller scope and everyone experiencing the same films the same books the same tv shows and the same video games most kids from that era experienced runescape because you could just find it and play it without needing to download it which is why when you look into youtubers like kit boga youtubers like the act man youtubers like i mean i'll just randomly pull up now outside xbox reforge gaming fillion these guys reference RuneScape because it was a part of their childhood. So one of RuneScape's biggest successes over other games was it was so accessible at a time when geek culture was so focused that it's almost become a part of our cultural zeitgeist, and now it can use that, uh, that cultural significance to just post and people know it. It's got name recognition. As long as Elon Musk mm. doesn't buy it and rebrand it to something dumb, oh, it'll be okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, can you can yeah. you imagine? Do you know, do you know, I, I kind of have some faith that Elon would run this bad boy quite well because he doesn't. Even oh, I really hope play. he doesn't even touch it. You, but again, that know, even even joking about know. Elon Musk buying and rebranding that is an in joke that we all get, and most people watching this will get. That shows that we all exist within this online content sphere. If I were to say that to my grandparents, they'd just be like, "It's nice, dear." <laughs> <laughs> I listened. <laughs> you know, I, it's funny you say this because I firmly believe the reason why I have continued to play RuneScape in a lot of ways for two reasons. Mm. Reason one, like we touched on earlier, was the ease of access nowadays versus back in the day. So, I mean, mm. back in the day, I was only able to play RuneScape 30 minutes a day. We had dial up, you know, and it's like that's that's all we could do 30 minutes a day. I and I away from dying. And I had to share that with my brother so we both had 15 minutes to play runescape and then on top of that when all of my friends went off and played guild wars when it came out and they were like we're gonna play guild wars factions or whatever it was called i was just like man my computer can't run it like i i can only play runescape this is the only thing i have and um you know i i kind of got forced into a position where it was the only game I could play, but I wanted to play it because I was limited to the ease of access. And it does make me wonder, kids nowadays that have ease of access to everything like that, they can just play it, whether it's Fortnite or whatever game it is. And I do think, are they going to form the same like emotional attachments to those games as we clearly have? Because we're, yeah, I'm, I'm 30 years old and I'm playing RuneScape. I played it when I was a little kid. You know, so and I still they, they already do, bro. I'll Absolutely. be on TikTok and I'll see like these memes is like where we land in boys, and they don't got like the original <laughs> Fortnite map, and then like sadness comes on. So they already yeah. have these attachments to <laughs> the games that we would because back when I was growing up, I'd have my friends over, we play like Super Mario Smash Bros. Melee. I couldn't imagine getting on like Discord at like 10 and playing Fortnite. That sounds <laughs> insane in my mind. Maybe it would have been better. I don't think so. I'm quite glad we lived through the stage we lived in, but they have they're going to have a completely different experience. What you've brought up here is a really interesting psychological phenomenon. And again, stop me if I go too far into this, but literally you kind of reading up on this and learning all of this was fascinating for me and it links so strongly back to acting and the creation of emotion because acting was all about creating an emotional connection within someone or something and keeping it going it links to my absolute favorite word of all time the favorite word is phenomenology and phenomenology is the study of the whole event through the lens of human experience now for example did you guys ever play Old school PC RPG games like I'll use Baldur's Gate One as an example. You guys play Baldur's Gate One? So Baldur's Gate One came on six CDs, and to oh. install it, oh you needed God. to open the CD drive and put in disc one and install and wait for ages. If you guys ever installed an old PC game using a CD right. drive, how long did that take to install? It would take all day. Sometimes if you're downloading an MMORPG, you'd be like, right, this will be ready in six hours' time. I'll do that. That anticipation build up for the game not even part of the game but it's still part of your experience of the game it fits into what we call the phenomenology of the entire experience it's the anticipation it's the looking forward to it it's the going to blockbuster it's the picking out a video off the shelf it's the reading the blurb on the back it's the driving home looking at it it's getting a game boy game when your parents are driving the car and you're trying to play the game boy screen waiting for the street light to zip past the car so you can get a brief look of where the hell you are in pokemon red and blue this is the phenomenology of playing it the more difficult something is to achieve, the greater the emotional impact or the kind of ingraining factor will have in your brain. We talked about doing all these difficult things. RuneScape took a long time to download. It took a while to find. It took a while to find your friends. You couldn't just teleport all the way other place. How amazing does it feel when you can finally teleport to Varrock or teleport to Fawador? The problem is we went through of these struggles because there was no other choice. You had to go through these struggles to get them this was the only way to do it. You had to go to Blockbuster to rent a video. You had to go to the library to find a book. You had to put effort in in order to get the thing you wanted out. And the act of putting the effort in, even though it's not the final product itself, is still part of the phenomenology of the experience of the product because you have to do it. Now, yes, kids have Fortnite to experience. The problem is you can immediately download a video game almost any time, anywhere, with absolutely no effort. I've got an emulator on my PC. I think, oh my God, I want to play some more PlayStation 1 games. I can download them straight away and then sit and play them. And for some reason, I'm sat there playing them. And I'm thinking, 
this isn't the same. This doesn't feel the same exactly. as I felt when I was a kid. And that's because I can't feel the carpet underneath me as I sit cross-legged with a little, you know, heated up microwave burrito next to me and a glass of orange juice as I'm looking up at my CRT TV and watching the scan lines move down. Oh, I can't yeah. see the, the sun setting out the window. I can't wait for my friend to pop round and us to sit there. And I had to balance books on top of my PlayStation 1 because the laser disc didn't read it quite well <laughs> enough. And I had to slowly push things down to make it work. The amount of people that went through these same experiences. I would have the wire in the back of the PlayStation 2, which connected to the SCART lead in my TV, slowly fall out of place. So I would just be precariously balancing things on like a collection of wires to get the connection perfect and then stay very still while I played it. That was part of the phenomenology of the game, and that's part of what creates our experiences of it. If you ever waited in line for a midnight release of a game, that's part of your experience of the game. If you ever saw a film on day one, being in the cinema with people in cosplay, that's part of your experience. Now, kids today have different experiences like this. They can go to massive conventions and see people in costume from the film. You can go to Cameo and have famous actors and famous you know, people, whatever line you want them to read. You can just drop people. You can just tweet at people if you want to. They have different experiences to us, but what they don't often have is the struggle of getting the product to work. Yeah, We struggle to make the product work, whereas the product is a hell of a lot easier to get for them. And because of that, they won't have the early experience of the phenomenology of the anticipation of building up to it. If you wanted to play World of Warcraft back in the day, you didn't download it, you bought a load of CDs. You bought that battle chest. And that's why people still love that. So will kids have the same experience we had? Not exactly the same, because yeah. they won't have to go through the difficulty and the effort of trying to get the experience they want. They'll just have the experience straight away. Might not create a lasting impression. I, I miss those times. Just going to school and everyone would tell you how far they are in the game or what kind of cheat. I remember the duplication cheat in like Pokemon Silver. Oh, yeah, you... man, that kid whose uncle worked at Nintendo. Oh, of course, tell you. always. Oh, you yeah, had to right? pull the, the link cable out uh, at exactly uh, the right time, which would duplicate the Pokemon. Yeah. But, <laughs> and you know what that creates? That's really interesting. That creates mystery. I think, and again, I'm going to sound boomer as hell saying this, but one of the things that the internet has very much done is removed a layer of video game mystique or yep. mystery. Now, it's created another layer with things like Herobrine and things like Sonic.exe, you know, crazy creepy pastas of the internet. But access to immediate information about absolutely everything has very much removed that foggy gray zone where people don't quite know. And so everyone discusses theories about what could be there. And that's where crazy creativity gets brought up. Yeah. Oh yeah, dude. Like when everyone was talking about where Pokemon, like when Mew, the glitch yeah, from Mew on Blue no. version, and oh, missing no and fishing in the fountain, and that would be the talk of the the schoolyard. Yeah. That doesn't. I I assume that doesn't exist anymore. I, I'd assume now it's more like drama or some favorite YouTuber ice. Oh race, god. So you know? I was yeah. working as a drama teacher about five years ago, and the the number one job. So the and again, stop me if this gets boring to you guys, because to me this is fascinating. I love it, dude. The one job desired by school children has changed throughout the decades. It's gone from astronaut to rock star to actor to YouTuber. Yeah. And when yeah, I would say to, to, uh, to yeah. kids that I work with, oh, I, uh, I've, I've made some YouTube videos before. This was before I made it on YouTube, and I was just putting some stuff out. I remember one kid, like seven years old, go, are you Mr. Beast? <laughs> and I thought about saying yes and riding that high for a while, but I was actually working in London when Game of Thrones season one and two came out. And if I let my hair grow curly, I look exactly like Rob Stark did back in the day. I got a lot of free drinks saying I was Rob Stark's stuntman. I can see that. Uh, yeah, sure I can cool, see that. It worked really well. The great uh, thing was, I took a lot of photos of people who believed me when I said that. So now somewhere there is a guy with a picture of me and him on his phone. I hope he finds my videos on YouTube now and is like, when the hell did I meet Josh scrolling back through his phone? <laughs> but kids nowadays want to be YouTubers. That's what they want to be. So they don't discuss video game secrets. They discuss YouTuber drama. And yeah. they discuss Twitch drama and TikTok mm -hmm. drama. And it is Always so drama. tribal. And it is so cult. And I know that a lot of people say to me, oh, these influencers, they don't really influence kids that much. They do. 
They absolutely scarily, mm-hmm. absolutely scary. I've I've had to have so many chats with, and this is something that personally worries me a lot. There are so many awful role models for both young boys and young girls out there living completely fake lives, renting these expensive cars, renting these expensive planes, renting you know, people mm-hmm. to be Lifestyle involved gurus. in their in their lifestyles. And the kids think it's completely real and completely achievable and completely doable. And then you see people who are fantastic role models, things like Will Tennyson is one of my favorite fitness influencers. I think Will Tennyson makes incredible YouTube videos. And you get things like Joey Swole on Twitter. These people who are genuinely good inspirations. But I see so many YouTubers, Twitch streamers, and influencers having such a negative effect on young kids, especially young boys having no role models, which has led to the rise of the manosphere, which is just a whole different problem but that's what we're kids are talking about now it's not oh did you know you can get mew under the truck it's oh did you know you've got to be a sigma male oh a yeah. chad yeah, Ugh, yeah. i think I, I think something to add to that is that um sometimes uh you know we're talking about like nostalgia or what it was like to be a kid or whatever i, I think sometimes like us older people be like kids these days are different but i don't think kids these days are necessarily different i think it's just the environment is different right and i like i always have to like remind people that like tr- trust me like if this kid was born in the same time as us that he he'd probably be like us too you know it's just the environment oh definitely Very much. And, and the environment sucks right now you know nurture. for a lot of it yeah. Yeah. There's the idea of are you naturally inclined to do something or are you nurtured into something? And I don't think any of the the kids that I've worked with in any of the schools are necessarily bad people themselves. But what this has led to, and I know this discussion has gone away from MMORPGs more into general culture, but the rise of the internet in general coincides with the rise of MMORPGs. Oh, yes. We are seeing people be exposed to, let's say, 50, 60 years ago, you probably would never see an incredible world-class bodybuilder. Unless you specifically sought out a bodybuilding magazine or you went to a competition, you're not going to see someone walk in front of you like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But now, you can see 10 physiques like that within 10 seconds on Google, which means people have a very warped view over what is normal. Instead of saying, oh my god, that was a -a once-in-a-lifetime experience, oh no, this is a hundred times a minute experience if you want to use the bank of human knowledge that we have. And how does this link back to MMORPGs and kids maybe not going on to them? Because we've actually seen that the vast majority of the MMORPG player base is 25 and older. A lot of kids don't seem to be going for this, and that's because what the hell were MMORPGs doing that was new and novel and amazing at the time. They were chat rooms with an RPG attached to them. EverQuest is just the world's prettiest chat room. You could talk to your friends in real time. That's not impressive anymore. And one thing that I've actually written down in my EverQuest guide is Elvis at the time was just this rebellious rock and roll star. Elvis changed the way music was written forever. Elvis was off the chain. He was mental. He was shaking his hips. You don't do that. But if you say to a kid now, hey, let me show you the most crazy, incredible, yeah. insane musician no. you'll ever see. You put an Elvis video on, they're going to say, what the hell is this? This isn't difficult. This isn't different. This is normal. <laughs> when something is groundbreaking, it's impressive at the time. But if you come back to it 20 years later, all you've got is a big pile of broken ground, which is no longer impressive to people. The MMORPG as a genre was impressive because it was doing things that were impressive at the time. Yeah, It's now struggling to do that. The reason Old School RuneScape has remained so successful is it's stuck true to what it does better than anything else. Yep. I, that, this that's can, a great way to... I'm sorry, Rex, oh, you go for it. I, I was just going to say, yeah. this can lead perfectly into one of the points I've written down, which is, what is the future of MMOs? Is it a dying yeah. genre? Because, you know, in the grand scheme of video games that are coming out, you've got gotcha games, mobile games, all of these fast dopamine feel-good games where you can just pick it up and feel like you've achieved something in a matter of minutes or even seconds versus the old-school traditional MMO where it can take days, weeks, months, years to get that same feeling. And I I have a really good um, starter for, for this topic, right? But it's also related to what, uh, you know, you said before, like, one of the greatest strengths of RuneScape is the fact that before, 
you didn't have to download it like other games i think i think one of the crazy things right is is back back in those days you you pretty much knew everybody everybody like in school played like even girls play or play runescape maybe for a week or two right like i i just i knew everybody that played so it was such a big big amount of people that like just you know cognitively knew about the game they might have even if it's only one day it's still like was memorable for them right and like fast forward 20 plus years is like you have runescape where okay you have you know us playing and then you have a lot of people that don't play but they used to play and then sometimes they do come back and play right and and then you compare it to like okay all these new kids that never play um you know runescape and they probably never will right it's because like why play runescape when you have you know things like uh fortnite or whatever i guess the point i'm trying to make is that like there's still such a huge pool of population of people now that knows about runescape so like the ch there's a chance that they'll come back so even if someone quits right there might be someone that used to play runescape might come back and just you know fill that mm. missing spot right so in my opinion i think that runescape th theoretically should be around for a long time because even though we don't get like new kids playing the game i, I honestly like i don't think i I rarely ever hear like a legit new player coming to play RuneScape. It's always like people yeah. that you know yeah. knew the game right when they were a kid. I think it's just like they're gonna keep replacing each other, right? Some some people take breaks. Some guy that played the game ten years ago, right? They they feel nostalgic. They just hear about RuneScape because they saw I don't know you know freaking gnome child meme randomly. They're like I want to play this game. I think it's just gonna keep doing that. So we should be like kind of you know balanced out for a yeah, long time. I, the, the only thing is psychological. There's, There's a really only... interesting psychological point you've brought up there with about the uh, the irony or the the paradox, if you will, of choice. Yep, exactly. There's a study done a while ago about soup flavors, and if you walk into a supermarket and there are two flavors of soup to choose from, you have to choose one of the two. That's all you've got. Now, same supermarket, thousands of flavors of soup. You'd assume people are happier because they have greater choice they can find the flavor that fits their exact needs but we've actually discovered that the opposite is true because the human brain doesn't necessarily work on what it does choose it pretty much compartmentalizes what it doesn't so instead of focusing on i've chosen this one flavor i'm going to enjoy it you then have oh but actually i've not chosen 999 when we talked about playing runescape when we were kids and other people going off to play guild wars there were fewer mmorpgs to choose from if you wanted to have an online experience playing games with friends over the long term, a continuous story, you had to choose one of these few games that were available. Now, there are way more, which means the MMORPG player base, the people that want that experience, is spread out across all of the games. It is diluted across the entire genre. But then we look into the fact of, because there are so many more games available, what experience does a new player want? Does a new player want to have to play for 20, 30, 40 hours before it gets good? Or does a new player want to experience downloading Apex Legends and jumping into a high-octane video game experience right now? So the MMORPG genre has to say, right, what are you giving the player base that they can't get somewhere else? Does a player want a long-term, slow-burn RPG experience? Okay. What can you do better than EverQuest? Because that does that really well. Does the player want high-intensity, difficult endgame raids? Because World of Warcraft does that really well. I fear that what's happened is we've built a lot of MMORPGs which give a lot of people a lot of experiences, and now when a new company turns upon the scene and says, hey, we're going to make an MMORPG, my first question is why? What are you going to give the player that they can't get from some other game somewhere else? And I've probably had one, maybe 200 small independent creators come into my discord drop me an email and say hey josh i'm making an mmorpg my first question is why i say well i just think i can do this better than this i say well as a single person likely good luck trying it i'll help you where i can but it's unlikely to succeed what experience does the mmo give it's slower it's it's definitely undeniably slower it's long term it's not novel anymore the cuss the video game industry now makes more money than movies, TVs, books, almost put together. The video game industry is massive. We have to say, right, we're a niche within a niche. Yeah. People who are so enfranchised in the MMORPG lifestyle forget that we are an incredibly small niche. Yes, 
people may leave, older players may return. New players are not going to want to jump in because you mentioned that RuneScape had everyone in your class knowing about it. Everyone in your class knew about RuneScape. Okay, that means that everyone in your class, however many years ago that was, if they wanted to have an online experience with friends, they didn't have as many choices, which means they were centralized within those games. They were concentrated. But now, if you have 30 kids in a class, every single kid could theoretically play a different MMORPG game. Yeah. And they're trying to convince all their mates to come and play their oh, game. Not gonna work. Their mates don't do that, which means that the game kind of sucks without them. And so they all just go and play an easy game. If it's difficult to get a consistent group of people to play a game, then it's probably going to be wiser to go to a game where you can just jump in, jump out with random people whenever you need to. This coincides with the rise of Group Finder. It coincides with the rise of things like Fortnite. You want an experience that you can have and then move on from. And this also very much links to the fact that the phenomenology of modern games is I want it quick, I want it now, I want to experience the best the game has to offer, I don't want to wait, I don't want to learn, I want to just go for it. That's not me being super boo kids are awful. Kids are great. They're learning skills way beyond what we have. They're making some incredible stuff. Lots of kids in schools, extremely intelligent. And it's not that we had better experiences. It's that we had much more concentrated, centralized experiences because there just wasn't as much choice. Now there's more choice. And it turns out that actually people don't want to play a game for 50 hours before it gets good. They want to play with their friends now and then move on to one of the other infinite choices they've got. The MMORPG is going to struggle to hold their attention. And it's yeah. competing against not only more MMOs, more games in general. I, I think in a so, way, yeah. that's probably one of Old School RuneScape's biggest strengths, is what, if you were going to make a game now in 2023, why would you even make an MMO? It's, it's like there are way more profitable and way smaller scopes that you can make of games that are just going to do better. And Old School RuneScape is, you know, it's a veteran at this point. It's an established MMO that has a lively pair, player base, it has constant updates, and it's been going for such a long time. And, um, you know... It's one of those things where I feel like over time, we probably will see less, I would assume, less MMOs coming out full stop. Because it's only really, I would say, catered towards people that want a long-term progressional goal, which, like you said, typically are going to be people within our age our age range who are people that have had to deal with you know terrible connection issues and, and like spending hours or whatever trying to install a game. Whereas, whereas kids nowadays, I just... I find it hard to see why it would be appealing to them. I, I, I do. They're, they're I struggle. True. I've had people that download a game, and if it doesn't work within five minutes, delete it. And it's been a 60 or 70 gigabyte download. They've downloaded it. It's been like, you know, incorrect file. They just deleted it. Now, I had to play Red Alert on a PC. I'd have to go into the ports and port forward everything. I'd have to change all the BIOS around and stuff. We'd have to make it work. But it's a different attitude of approaching it. If it doesn't work straight out of the box, then why shouldn't it work immediately? When you talked about, you know, what do people want from this? What's the experience that we're going to give people? When we, when we say to a kid, hey, come and play old school RuneScape. Okay, why? What's it going to do? Well, in a couple of weeks' time of playing it, you might be able to click on a dragon. That's no longer <laughs> yeah. interesting. It's no you know, longer... You, you but this leads, to to really, this leads to a huge paradox. People who make MMORPGs need to have a lot of money. Making an MMO compared to making a gacha game is a terrible decision. Like, if, if you gave me a million pounds and said, hey, make a video game, I would straight away make a mobile gacha game. That's yeah. all I would do. That's, that's the guaranteed income. A football game. FIFA Ultimate Team makes more money than FIFA, the actual organization that sells shit. That's ridiculous, shirt. bro. It's wow. insane. Oh, my God. Genshin, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Genshin I knew about Impact. that for a long while. Honkai Star Rail makes more money than should exist. It's absolutely insane. So when someone says, hey, I'm going to make an MMORPG, that person is telling me two things. One, they're extremely passionate about this genre. And two, they make terrible business decisions. <laughs> yeah. That's straight away the things I learn. If you're going to put a load of money into a genre that historically costs more than almost any other genre and has the worst return on investment, yep. why? So why are you doing this? What what you're saying is that people who are going to make MMOs at this point forward are either really stupid or really passionate 
right? Or not both. Ideally both. both. Or both, yeah. yeah. Straight up both. <laughs> God. That's why I'm saying, like, uh, you know, New World, I'm like, oh, dude, whoever convinced, like, Amazon to green like that, like, damn, he he's crazy. And he's also very nerdy. And same New with League World. of Legends, right? The, the, whoever's, like, pitching that for League of Legends, like, they they must be hella passionate. They must have played, like, a lot of RuneScape or World of Warcraft or something. And they're yeah. on top, it, you know, of their, like, company. An MMO it. is the kind of thing that I, I feel like... And I'm I'm definitely biased here, but like in a, in a lot of ways, it's the kind of thing that only a bit of a boomer can fully understand how good an MMO is. It's an like, acquired taste. <laughs> exactly. It's like we we grew up with it. For, for me, I played you know Sega Mega Drive, Dreamcast, PlayStation, Xbox, etc. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I got my PC and I went on RuneScape, and I was like, I was like, wait, the white dots are actually people behind their computers. I was like. Mm -hmm. I don't want to play PlayStation anymore. Why would I ever go back to a console? Like, this is it. This so is the way. You know what? That's impressive to you because that was new at the time. You say that to a kid right now, not impressive because it's not novel to them. And unfortunately, I very much believe that the idea of the metaverse is when older people than us have discovered video games for the first time. Been like, Oh my god, people are going to be so impressed when you can float around as a oh disembodied torso and see people. <laughs> so true. And I have to say to them, look, the only people that are excited about this are people who didn't play RuneScape. That's what it is. The only people who are excited about this idea of new technology being absolutely groundbreaking are ones who haven't lived it for a long time already. Yes, yeah. our generation very much went through, and people slightly before me as well with EverQuest and things like Ultima Online, they experienced a great boom in MMORPGs because you had to struggle. And when you struggle, the reward felt is inversely proportional to the struggle that you've gone through. You struggle for a long time, you achieve something amazing. That something amazing is fantastic. The question is, who's going to struggle for a long time now? Because we struggled because there was no other choice. Mm. Now, you run into struggle, you go something else. You struggle on this, you go to something else. Struggle on that, go to something else. One thing that I will say that I found a lot of newer gamers, if you will, if they cannot do something, instead of sticking at it and forcing themselves to do it because there's no other game that they have or you know, they haven't got enough money to go and buy another game, they just move on to another game that's easy. The irony of this is easy games keep people in the short term because they never challenge them but they don't keep people in the long term because they never give them the satisfaction of overcoming a challenge. This is a good topic. Um, this might be a can of worms, but like, you know, sometimes when people ask me, like, how do you stick to playing RuneScape or whatever? Like, like when I, when I sell someone, like, why you should play RuneScape? But, but mainly because they ask me, right? I, I always just tell them, like, so like, in a philosophical way. It's like, it's about the effort that you put in to grinding your goal. And getting it done because i swear a lot of new people they don't they don't know what that is like right and then and then like they're so surprised they're like what that's that's a that's a concept that exists you put in a lot of work and then you feel amazing about it like i tell you like it's exponentially way more amazing if it took you like 20 extra hours to get something done you know so it, it actually does work sometimes like i actually convert some people and they like they come back you know after a few months i'm like well i actually got my first fire cape like I didn't think it was possible, but this is so, like, uh, that felt so great. Feel I'm like, awesome. yes, yeah. keep, keep it up, you know? So it's really interesting how, I, I guess, like, you know, even though things become more convenient over the years, more and more and more, right? And then, you you know, you get the dopamine faster and faster. I feel like a lot of people feel more empty inside, and they, they get very, more Very, very much so. It's like eating Being sugar. Confused. Yes, yeah. you feel great in the short term because, oh, my God, sugar rush. And then you realize it's empty. There's nothing there. It's very, very hard to convince someone, though, to keep pushing through the awkward, difficult times. Because human nature is to step back and find the easier route. We, sure. we struggle at something. We don't want to continue struggling. We go and find something easier. We then do that. It's more pleasurable. We all want to stay in bed. Nobody wants to get up at the crack of dawn and go for a run outside. Some people do find pleasure in it, but nobody necessarily wants to. No one's excited about it, but it's a good thing to do. And this is one of the things that I see about newer content creators. Everyone wants to be a YouTuber. Nobody wants to be a researcher. Nobody wants to be an editor. Nobody wants to be a thumbnail designer. Nobody wants to be a proofreader. 
And yet, if you want to be a YouTuber, you're all of those things and more. Everyone wants the really good bits without going through the really sucky bits. Yeah. And then you realize that actually it's only given value by surviving going through the really sucky bits. Same with MMORPGs. Yeah, it sucks to get all the way to Jad and die. But it's very difficult to explain to someone the incredible elation getting all the way to Jad and succeeding after dying several times. Because most people just won't bother getting there. They will quit and go and do something that is easier. We are, and this is something that I've seen in schools a lot. We are seeing a shift, a generational shift, away from challenging people toward making sure people never feel challenged because that gives them anxiety. Now, I understand that the, uh, the social stigma behind having an anxiety disorder needs to be dispelled, and we need to make sure we are taking care of people's mental health. That is a hugely important thing to do in general in society. But I do sometimes worry that we are swaying so far away from making sure anyone is ever exposed to anything challenging ever that we are not giving people the chance to take on something difficult and come through the other side of it and feel the elation that, that brings and with video games and mmorpgs specifically games designed around long-term challenge very few people overcome the long-term challenge which means very few new people are joining. Old people will tell you how amazing it is, but then new people will expect modern day game design. They'll expect much faster teleporting. And I play RuneScape 3 for a bit. I get used to the Lodestone network teleporting me all around. I go back to old school RuneScape and I miss the fact I don't have all those teleports. Part of my brain is thinking, oh my God, I want those Lodestones back. The other part is thinking, hang on, have those just taken away the satisfaction of gaining all the magic teleports? yeah i completely agree I'm, I'm not i'm not a parent so you know i i do think about having kids and stuff and i i think about bringing a child into like this day and age and i i often think about it to be honest and uh it does concern me and i i think at the end of the day it's like a lot of the responsibility falls on to the, the parents absolutely but at the same time children are just so good at absorbing information they're like sponges so obviously if they're in a if they're in an environment whether it's school or they're with their friends you know they're probably bound to go down certain pathways that you may not approve of yeah. um it, it's it's so difficult because like you know sometimes i think about it and i'm quite naive because i don't have kids and i think if i have a, if i had a child would i like to just almost banish it from being able to go on technology and stuff like that and maybe just be like oh let's play some games time to go on runescape there you go but then at the same time i'm thinking if i were to actually do that i'm sure they would enjoy it but there would be a social pressure when they get to school and they might get picked on because they're different and all the other kids are playing with their tablets and they're playing all these new flashy games so it's like it's just a minefield like what, what could you do yeah, to, to add on to that i, I think you're right i think it really does come down to like you know some parenting like you know maybe just letting your kids be aware that like hey sometimes you know just playing the most convenient stuff isn't always going to give you the most satisfaction i don't know how easy it would be to sell that idea to a kid at an early age and teach them like hard work you know means greater like enjoyment and satisfaction in life but i think i think we should try i think as you know if you're a parent you should really try to do that because I, like for I, I don't want to talk bad about my little cousins but mm. but you know i feel like <laughs> sometimes my uncles they don't really teach their kids like much you know i mean like it's cool that they let them do whatever right play all the games and stuff but i've noticed that with my little cousins they just seem like they they don't really have much ambition going on mm. like they, they just feel like everything's too struggle too much of a struggle like going to school is a struggle like just getting good grades is a struggle because like all they do is just play games that are like you instantly load right and then you play for 20 minutes and you can either stop there that's it or you can you know do it again i, I don't know it's something something's up with it and it, it's definitely very uh you know uneasy just looking at them kind of like you know they're in high school now but i see like they don't even a lot of them don't even like try to do sports or anything they just you know just seem kind of lost and it's not just my like you know my, my little cousins i, I do yeah. do notice it a lot overall 
I think one of the biggest changes, and I've seen this while teaching and I've seen this while talking to younger content creators or even talking to people that engage with my content, the biggest change is that people are now incredibly offended by being bored. It's essential to be bored by yourself and to find something to do that isn't an external source of dopamine. It's okay to be bored. You don't need, and I'm, I'm not going to be like, boomer, mobile phone bad. No, no, it's okay. Mobile phones are fantastic. There's so much cool stuff social media has given us. But this links back to MMORPGs pretty heavily. The downtime between stuff in MMOs is boring. Sitting in EverQuest and recovering your mana is boring. Chopping trees for a long time in old school RuneScape is boring. This gameplay is boring. It's okay to be bored because you then find things around the boredom chatting to people, having it on the second monitor. What I am seeing a rise of, and this is, again, as a generational difference, I'm seeing people be personally upset at the concept of them being bored. And what we're talking about is, right now, must be something that entertains people at all times. You mentioned earlier about playing Aladdin on the the Mega Drive. Aladdin is a hard game. Did you ever finish it? I... uh... I think I may have, but I do remember getting reset to the first level uh, many a times. And how frustrating is that? It's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> so when you combine older generational idea of being bored more often and then experiencing frustration more often, you become essentially inoculated to these two things. You become almost resilient to them. Things that frustrate People who've been through a lot of frustrating times tend to not affect them as much, and things that are boring tend to not affect people who are used to being bored as much. So when you take someone who has played a frustrating game, solved a frustrating puzzle, or had a frustrating job, said to them, hey, this is going to be quite frustrating, they say, not a problem, I can deal with that, that's okay, I've got the experience. And when you take someone who's been used to being bored, or you know, there wasn't too much to entertain, wasn't too much to do, and older people said this all the time, oh, there wasn't much to do, so we just made do. Yes, I understand, which has given you a great resilience to being bored. I've literally mm. seen my granddad just sit there and stare into space for like an hour at a time when waiting for something. Like we can be sat there together waiting for a bus or a train. He'll just stare. I'm like, what are you thinking about? Best. He's like, no, nothing. I'm just sat being bored. I know Best. I'm going to do nothing for the next hour. That's a thing he's used to doing. Whereas my mind is thinking, I need dopamine. I need entertainment. Mm. I need something to happen to me. And if that's happening to me as a, an adult, that's going to be way worse in kids. Because that's just the environment they've been brought up around. goes back to the nature versus nurture debate. But what we have for MMORPGs specifically, the 25 to 35 demographic, we have a demographic that were brought up on the rise of the internet, that often played frustrating video games when they were younger, that often had more downtime between dopamine hits for their brain. So you had people that were both tech savvy, because they were there when it was born, okay with being bored, okay with overcoming frustrating gameplay, and still attracted to the novelty of this amazing online world where we could speak to each other. It's this perfect storm of traits that make an MMO enjoyable. That yeah. perfect storm has subsided. Know. You know, it, 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 might be a, it might seem like a bit of a side tangent here, but speaking about, you know, kids in school nowadays who aren't allowed to be bored and uh, mm. not allowed to cause anxiety and such. So I remember when I was in primary school, which I'm not entirely sure what that is for Americans. What do you know what that would be? Like, yeah, like elementary? One, one, first, probably, second, yeah, third, probably elementary. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I was in year three, and bear in mind at this time I was just a I was just a kid that just liked to play on his BMX, play video games, mm-hmm. BMX. That was it. And I remember my teacher on a Friday. She said to me, she said, "Tom, I want you to remember this word, and I'm going to ask you about it on Monday." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, sure." And then bell goes weekend happens i just forget all about it and then on the monday morning the teacher started the class and she said she said tom stand up so in front of the entire class of like 30 of my friends she said what was the word that i taught you to spell on on friday and i just stood there and i was just like you t- like what word is she talking about i had no idea what she was even talking about and the word was the t-h-e and I shit you not, I I was a little kid, man, but I remember just being stood there, feeling like the biggest dumbass in front of all of the people in my class. And from that moment on, I was like, okay, I need a 
buckle up my ideas and I need to start like actually paying attention here because I'm falling behind, man. I don't want to be that kid. Like I need to actually get my ideas together. But like I, that stuck with me, you know, like 20 odd years later. And I think back to that all the time. If that never happened to me, I may have just continued going through life and just like not really paying that much attention. You know, those things I think were some of the most significant changing points in my life that then oh, shaped me to be topic. the person that I am now. Yeah, that's a great topic. Wait, Min, you were going to say something, though. Sorry. sorry, Min, do you want to say something? Oh, sorry. I was I was just talking about gaming. I have nothing about kids. I mean, if we want to share kindergarten <laughs> memories, I got some pretty bad ones. <laughs> but, um, sorry, on a whole unrelated note, mm -hmm. talking about gaming as a, as a business, it kind of mm -hmm. excites me to see how far we've grown and how content creators are getting not only capital, but also a sense of influence and power to the point where we can actually start seeing people who grew up off games finance their own games. Uh, example yes. with Shroud, Dr. Disrespect, I believe Eve, or sorry, Ashes of Creation was fan-made. So It, it will it be looks, if it ever gets made. Yeah, <laughs> if it ever gets made. So that was on my mind, is uh, just seeing how gaming is growing, how the to be able to make games is going to be easier and the people making the games yes there's going to be businesses uh corporations but there might actually be a lot of people who love the games deep down and they have the capital to do it and mm -hmm. more importantly the hype to push these games i mean you got to pay people just to play a game now hundreds of thousands I, mean, of I was lucky enough to be invited to jagex to review necromancy before it came out and as a massive runescape fan i was absolutely thrilled in fact i remember speaking to um it was uh, Chivalric and Waydots, the two two excellent RuneScape 3 content creators. And when we all we were sat in this hotel, we got sat in these taxis and we were you know, taxied off to Jagex headquarters. And I was trying to you know, speak to them and say hi and reply to some messages on my phone. And it, it, like halfway through the day, Chivalric walked up to me and went, I was really scared you were going to be a complete dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, why? He's like, because you're a big content creator. I just assumed that was what was going to happen. I'm like, well, I appreciate the fact that you came up to me and have the you've explained this to me. But no, let's try and all get on together. We're all here as massive geeks. And the cool thing about the the content creator subculture, the rise, if you will, is we're seeing people who are super genuinely passionate about these games, and they're now having input on the future of these games. Because as they say, players are amazing at spotting problems. And terrible at providing solutions. But if I say to someone, hey, what's wrong with this? MMORPG players can tell me exactly what's wrong with anything at any given time. What they cannot say is exactly how to fix it. Mm -hmm. They can say what they think would be the best thing to fix it without understanding they're breaking like five other things while doing this. But they can definitely identify problems. What we've got to the point now, especially with content creators, is we can see where people can both identify problems and offer solutions that would be relevant to the game the content creators can come in, offer that, and leave, which I think is great. Seeing people get their own uh, kind of cameos as well, because you've got Charlie Moist Critical appearing in the Artix games, like so Adventure cool. Quest 3D and Adventure Quest yeah. Worlds. You've got <laughs> the, yeah, all these kind of cameo things, which are fantastic. Almost all the big YouTubers appearing in Free Guy, the, the Hollywood film about that. We have people going across for that. It was, it's very much a, a new cultural thing where we can make a living talking about video games but that needs to have a foundation of both being entertaining and knowledgeable about the game and and this is a really big one really big one need to know how to actually communicate to someone else your opinions thoughts and feelings about the game because i've met so many teachers who are super knowledgeable about a subject and awful at explaining it yeah i mean that's the entire reason we made this podcast was because all three of us uh mm -hmm. i i don't really know if you know us individually but we, I've we all through your content and watched a lot of your money making guides hey. <laughs> <laughs> i hope you learned something but we all make very different content very different like we're, we're all from the same game but we all do very mm -hmm. different things in the game rice cut plays an iron man he's a maxed iron man which is just madness mince pk respect the room crafting guy for that is ridiculous yeah and, and then i kind of just do a little bit of everything but i mainly focus on helping people make money and progress through the game and mm -hmm. you know we we made this podcast with 
we all have different thoughts and opinions like let's share them let's get content creators on let's talk about the game like let's talk about the things that are good let's talk about the things that are bad and let's just have an open honest discussion about it and you know see where that leads us and it's that honesty i mean i made a, a guide to the fight caves maybe two or three years ago a guide to getting your first fire cape killing jad and i broke everything down as simple as i could and people have messaged me saying hey thank you this guide has been really instrumental in helping me get through the fight caves because it was a combination of the entertainment factor with basic editing with the teacher side of just explaining to someone how to do this i mean yeah i've got your page open right now you're uh, making 140 million in three days on a new account that's really impressive I've learned mostly just go and kill the bots in the rev caves, which was just the oh, the rev caves was a whole pile of <laughs> bad choices that were made by Jagex at the time. Was it Mod Jed uh, with the corporeal beast as well? There was a thing. Oh yeah, that. there's. A lot I remember of stuff. reading yeah. a tweet because he bought an Audi with uh, a lot of the the money, and someone tweeted out an Audi as blue as the Elysians that paid for it. Which <laughs> <laughs> I thought was brilliant. Yeah, that's a throwback. Yeah. yeah but, you know, we, we all gather together and we share the knowledge. And this kind of knowledge, this kind of uh, passion used to be shared on forums. And it used to be shared within guilds. And sometimes it would be shared in real life by phys people physically drawing maps and writing things down. This level of passion for any specific MMORPG has always existed since we've had MMORPGs. But what YouTube, Twitch, or you know, the general internet has allowed people to do is globally share it, connect with people all around that share that same passion. And while this goes back to the bodybuilding example, 20 years ago, you'd maybe meet a couple of people who were into the same video game that you were, because you'd be relying on pretty much meeting them physically. No, you can meet everyone who plays that game. It's insane. Yeah. Oh, I, I completely agree. And, you know, just out of curiosity, on a time horizon, let's say five years, where would you see MMOs fitting into the current, uh, or, or just how would they evolve? In, in my thought, uh, just going back to Ashes of Creation, and also going back to our further conversation where when we all started playing MMOs when we grew up, it was mainly just to talk to people. That was the biggest thing. Completely new. Now you go on every game, you can talk to whoever you want, voice lobby. It's amazing. So I feel like with Ashes, and I don't know if I'll play it or not because I'm a RuneScape addiction nerd, but with the nodes and the towns and how it changes and you can change the tax rates and you can uh, vote people in as a higher up position that can control the town in certain mm -hmm. ways. And it seems like MMOs maybe in the future will just be ever evolving off every decision you make in the game. I'm going to be honest, I very much believe that kind of stuff sounds good to a marketing crowd, and then when you put it into a game, the vast majority of the player base never actually interacts with it, and it ends up being extremely upper echelons of the game, because you saw the same thing in New World, we saw the same thing in Mortal Online, we saw the same thing in Terror to a degree, there was a king within the game that could allow things. Whenever you give the player the ability to interact with the community, it will be the 1% of the 1% of the top players who end up making a huge amount of those choices for the community. I think that MMORPGs will advertise themselves as player-run, and then when you put it into the actual player-run experience, we get what New World was, which was within one month, pretty much one guild dominating yeah. any server that it was on all the time. We get people like in Albion Online maxing out the cost to use their specific crafting thing unless you're within that guild. And you get this divide between the casual players and the hardcore players growing even more because the only people who have got the time or the money or even the inclination to change the game to the degree the game lets you is the hardcore. And the hardcore will always have their own self-interests. And then you have the casual players who see this system being manipulated by a group of players they're nowhere near and will never be anywhere near. They have to just interact with it. And to that way, you become, well, as a casual player, you effectively become the minnows that are swimming around this pool dominated by the hardcore sharks that are changing things. So I think that the ashes of creation, players can change the game. Sounds amazing until you actually play it and realize that the vast majority of the experience that an MMORPG player wants, especially a modern MMORPG player, is good gameplay designed by mm -hmm. the actual devs to be played, experienced, and possibly replayed. 
like a dungeon in World of Warcraft, like a raid or a fractal in Guild Wars 2, like any of the Delves in the Elder Scrolls Online, like the the hardcore Ultimates in Final Fantasy XIV. The more power yeah. you give a so player, qu question to play. clarify uh, the, the topic. So like the so like the, the one of the selling points of these games is that like like what can you do exactly to control or like change the game? Like can you literally change like the entire town structure or something or like what that's is what, what they're going for in the maps or something like that? Yeah, that's literally everything like that. <laughs> and and to break it down even more wow. because I do believe ex everything you said, Josh, sounds like the biggest hurdle they got to overcome because it is always the hardcore mm -hmm. feasting off the absolute noobs, you know, to an extreme degree. But to break it down more, even if, say, a self-economy or maybe governance of a game does not work out, maybe they got to find the right formula. I do believe some of the other things like, say, if you haven't cleared out this mob patch, you know, there's mobs around the game, and this certain mob patch hasn't been touched, over time, those mobs will grow and get stronger. And if you never touch that game or that area, you might never be able to go and wander past that. And I believe no other MMO has even thought or... Been they had that close in to. Guild Wars 2. So what Do happened they? with how, Guild Wars 2 is that? Guild Wars 2 has got the uh, teleportation points around the map that you unlock by going to them and they can then teleport them. If a high-level mob wanders over the teleportation point, it will lock it off within a war until someone goes to it and kills the mob or deals with the event that's by the teleportation point and then effectively unlocks it again for everyone. So the maps did have that dynamic changing thing. What ended up happening was everyone would just teleport to whatever the nearest teleport port was that they needed and then just run anyway. Very few people engaged with the content that would help mm -hmm. another person if it wasn't necessarily helping them at the time being. There was... I think one a while ago. I mean, the craziest example of an absolutely insane mechanic that I can think of in an MMORPG was in the game Underlight. Now, Underlight had a spell in it that would delete another player's character. <laughs> not, not <laughs> Yo, Mint Mac House memes. Yeah, actually delete that. their character it had to be there was a super long quest to go into it you had to talk to a games master to get it only leaders of guilds had it it was very very rarely oh used God. but it was there and that was a oh, perfect example of toxic. okay yeah this is a massive role play only game if you piss off this guild leader he won't kill you he'll remove the character oh my that God, has now been removed from the worse. game <laughs> and look into any of these games that promise player controlled anything the people that want to engage with this do. The people that don't want to engage with it are forced to because they have to engage with the game. And then you get into this real toxic environment of we're in charge, you do what we say. Yeah. Which yeah. Runescape one... Wilderness Revs was like that for a bit. Yeah. And yeah. um Yeah. Well, nah, it's just, uh, this sucks. Yeah. A great example of that, too, is in RuneScape, there's a world 445, I believe, called Dead the Man. Dead Man Mode world. Mm -hmm. And they just revamped it in a way, I'm pretty sure it's still dying, but originally it'd be one world, everything's PvE, save zones in a bank, you die, you lose everything in your bank and stats. And over, I would say, a month, it went to complete shit. It would be one yeah. clan controlling the economy, it controlled the training spots, it would kill off the game, and then they would swap the gold. And anytime you tried to play it, they would, you know, imagine training cows and three dudes and ancestral come up. What are you going to do, right? So what would be I, ideal I is you want to take, you, you don't, you want your game to have hardcore players because hardcore players are some of the best evangelists for your game. They're going to tell people about the game. You want the hardcore players to see new players and think, fantastic. I can train them. I can work with them. I can bring yeah. them along with me and give them the best possible experience in this game. If you have a game that is built around seeing new players and thinking you're a threat, you're a problem to me. I need to deal with you. I need to make sure you can't ever, you know, usurp me. That's when the hardcore players who have the skill, the power, the time, and the authority look at all the new people coming in and make sure to keep them subjugated and keep them down. I understand that I'm using a lot of very emotional words for this, but in almost every single game that we've seen that says players will be able to take over and control areas it doesn't become this positive democratic let's make the game the best we can for everyone experience it becomes a tyrannical i'm in charge 
I mean, one of the examples we've seen that's done it relatively well, I'd say, would be EVE Online. And that's because in order to be in charge at all in EVE Online, there is so much logistical stuff you need to deal with. And a focused attack from another group can destabilize whatever you've already built up. But a lot of MMOs get to the point where one guild can't be stopped. And a one-way war is no fun for anyone. This yeah. is why the wars and the battles tends to reset so often in MMORPGs. Because the irony is an MMORPG is all about gaining consistent and permanent buffs to your character to then wander around the world. It's about gaining power and keeping it and not resetting it. That's the value of playing it. But then when you say to guilds, hey, you can gain value and power, keep it, and it won't reset, that's unfair to everyone that isn't in those guilds. So you're almost having two conflicting design ideas. You want a long-term power fantasy, but if you have a long-term power fantasy that people can never compete against, you aren't going to keep people for the long term that aren't winning. Yeah, yeah I remember... I, I, go for it. No, you can go. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go after. Oh, I, I was going to say, I, I, I love the experiment they're doing, though, to try to create a process where that does not go to shit. And I, I'm a believer in a way that there may be a way to create something like that. Everything else so far has been a past failure. Mm -hmm. uh, mainly my biggest interests are game economies it, mm -hmm. to, to the point where it's crazy that some people actually have a job just to monitor a game's economy. They'll be an econo e economist, I guess the word is, mm -hmm. but they live in a video game. And they mm -hmm. create, like, let's say, Dead Mimma, or sorry, uh, Old School Runescape has grand exchange taxes that burn money and items, right, it, to make a fully working deflationary economy. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So maybe in the next five years, MMOs, if they do have a resurgence, will have an incredibly diverse economy going mm -hmm. forward that makes this kind of gameplay worthwhile. Or maybe it fails. But in the next five years, that's kind of how I see MMOs. If they are going to create an MMO, it's mm. going to have a beautiful economy and then some sort of interactive map or mods or something to where you impact the game as a player, to where you, you feel like you're doing something, almost like a sand. We then have to ask the question, if a player isn't satisfied impacting their own character, what is giving that extra benefit to impacting the world as a whole? If if a player needs to know that their contribution is affecting the game world as a whole, then how much do we police this? How much effort do we put into making sure they're not making that unfair? And if a game company is making that game, they have to say, right, how much effort and time and manpower effectively do we want to put into making sure this stays balanced when we could just remove this system and instead make the traditional MMORPG? That's one side of the issue. The second one is you said you see a new MMO releasing and doing all this well. And if it does all that well, I'd be super happy. That'd be amazing. The problem is, the biggest uphill problem we've got is an MMORPG, as we discussed earlier, becomes a personality. It becomes a lifestyle. It becomes just borderline an addiction. And when you make a better MMO than everything else, you're not just kind of competing with the mechanical side of the other games you're competing with the time investment and the emotional side and the personal side of everyone that's invested in those games. If I come along and make a game that's better than every single MMO in the world and say, hey guys, come and play this, it's better in every way, every technical way you can imagine. People will say to me, no thanks, all my friends are here. All my memories yes. are here. All my focus is here. My personality is here. I've got my RuneScape mouse mat in front of me. I've got my Guild Wars poster hanging up. I've got my World of Warcraft cosplay going on. I've got my Final Fantasy XIV phone cover. I'm really invested emotionally making these things part of my personality. It's no longer just a game. It's now part of my lived experience. So the difficulty in making a new MMORPG is not just making a technically better game. It's making a game so much better that it is willing and able to rip away years of enfranchised love. And that's never going to happen. So that's kind of got me to the next thing here is that I'm an optimist. If I was a betting man, I probably would put money on <laughs> <laughs> Ash is a creation tell. not doing so well, but the, the gamer in me wants it to succeed. Mm. But 
Yeah, I was going to ask the next five years, what do you think MMOs are going to be? Are they going to be successful? Are they going to be growing? Or I feel like you already answered the question there. It's going to be very hard to compete in that world unless you're passionate, right? The general, the length of time that a video game has to go through to be made has increased substantially. In fact, random fact, this is why we don't get as many video game film games anymore. There was a time on the PlayStation 2 and for a while the PlayStation 3 where when a Disney film came out, when the Pixar film came out, you get a video game of it. You know, The Incredibles came out, here's a video game straight away. And now I said to someone, hey, where have all the video games based on films gone? And they said, oh, yeah, it's because the actual video game development cycle is now longer than the Hollywood film cycle, which means if you start making a video game and a AAA blockbuster film at the same time, the film will come out and the game will be like a year away from release. So no one will want it. You have to start making it before the film's even there. MMORPGs, the way this links in, is their development cycle is so bloody long. It's going to take something massive to stick. And... This is another kind of catch-22 irony. The genre, if it releases as a small indie MMO, is the antithesis of massively. It's not going to generate enough players to sustain itself, and it's going to die. We've seen lots of small MMOs come out, try and die, and then move on. So a small MMORPG won't be providing the things that the genre it won't be providing the things that the players of the genre want. They want something big. They want something massive. They want something amazing. Which means this thing, big, massive, and amazing, has to cost a hell of a lot of money. And when it releases, because of the nature of how you access a hell of a lot of money, unless you've personally funded it, it has to make a hell of a lot of money relatively quickly. Which means it has to be monetized to all hell. Which means people won't want to play it because people don't like microtransactions and people don't like when there's pay-to-win mechanics, which ironically make the most money. So you're caught between a rock and a hard place where in order for an MMORPG big enough and powerful enough and amazing enough to actually upset the status quo of RuneScape, World of Warcraft, Final Fantasy XIV, Guild Wars, and The Elder Scrolls Online, or Black Desert Online to a degree as well, for an MMORPG to be big enough to actually force itself in to that crowd, it has to have cost a load of money and make a load of money, which is difficult to do without monetization techniques that the people don't want. Yeah. I mean, look at look at New World, right? It's, it's... like they, they effectively had an endless amount of money to pour into that game, not to mention probably one of the biggest platforms in the world to advertise it. And, you know, we've seen how that's done. Um, but, you know, on that subject, let's go back to old school RuneScape a little bit here. So... Where in old school RuneScape are you up to, Josh? Like, are you an early, mid, late game player? Like, whereabouts are you so I can gauge? So about about a year ago, I got a quest cape. So Damn, I've managed to bro. finish every quest in the game apart from whatever's been released within the year. I don't want to go through and do that. The last really long quest I did was Song of the Elves. So yeah. I finished the Song of the Elves quest. I've maxed out all of the combat stuff. I've got most of my crafting and gathering skills to about 80 or 90 now, I haven't yet got a... What's the one below the fire cape? The Inferno stupidly game, powered yeah. Zuck kiln cape kind of yeah. thing. I haven't got the kiln cape. Oh, you... Yeah. Right, on a Inferno. side note, you you don't have to, but you do have to, because that will <laughs> that will change your view on gaming, I believe. Like, it's it's something. Um, So, it sounds to me like you've actually got towards the end game of RuneScape now. Yeah, yeah. So, I haven't experienced the higher level stuff, not the highest level stuff. Yeah. So I've done the raids, but I've not been successful enough in them yet. I got you. So you've yeah. you've pretty much gone through the mid game in that case, which mm. is historically old school RuneScape's weakest spot. It's the thing yeah. that people critique the most. You know, it's like early game levels, 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 and then all of a sudden you just hit a point, you hit a wall where it's like, okay, I just got to do this now for like another, yeah. you know, fifty hours before I can get to the next stage, and usually people. People so go through nightmares zone. from the men. So <laughs> it, instead of trying to recreate the will here by making a new MMO that's going to be successful for various different reasons, what are mm -hmm. the things that you would critique about old school RuneScape's mid game? What do you think is good and what do you think could be improved? So one thing that I think old school RuneScape does exceptionally well is when we refer to early mid game and end game, there is a huge amount of content in the mid game. And this is something that's not done as well in almost any other MMORPG. 
there's stuff to do in RuneScape all the time. And this is one of the good examples that I use. A lot of quests in RuneScape are within the middle of the game. There's early stuff to do. There's incredibly hard late stuff to do, but there's a lot of stuff in the middle. I think what RuneScape suffers from is a lack of polish within the mid game. And that's because you have the new players come in who want to experience a great early game. And to be fair, they've done pretty well giving like adventure lines and early stuff and very, very nicely guided ways to get into the early game. Use this skill, kill this enemy, go to here, get this item. That's decent. And they've really pushed the engine to what it can do with the raids at the end. The fact we're still working on the 0.6 ticks system and we're making bosses as complicated as we are, that's incredible. So what I think development time has been taken away from the mid game a bit because they think, right, if a new player has stuck with the start, they've got to push through this. And if an end game player is doing raids, they're not going to worry about this too much. But I'm going to be honest, I think RuneScape's mid game is actually one of its, one of the genres strongest examples of a mid game okay let's pour some food out for my cat otherwise she'll keep oh keep... there was a cat <laughs> it was a cat I keep shouting I like, this dog's making weird. some weird noises <laughs> it's but you one know thing that i think runescape's mid game can improve on is uh, you have a very quick early game which is excellent because there's stuff unlocking, 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 unlocking new choices, new stuff, new paths, new areas then the mid game comes on and what do you do and where do you go? There's a hell of a lot of choice. Do you go to Ardoon and talk about all of the, the play that's happening there? Do you go down to the Felled Up Hills? Do we go over to, Dar to I was going to say Darkovia, mm -hmm. but that's from, uh, Darkovia is from Adventure Quest. I'm thinking of Maya Ditch. Do we go over to there? Where Maya's do we ditch. go? Yeah, that's the one. There's a huge amount of, of choice within the mid game of old school RuneScape. And I think it's very overwhelming to a player who's just unlocked it or got there. It's also the first time that you start to grind forgotten content. Yeah. And that very much needs a bit of a, a makeover. When someone says to me, hey, you need a gout tuba. Oh, fantastic. I'll just go and chop a load right. of those uh, <laughs> crack spars, <laughs> shall I? Oh, you need to go and do a, a, a trouble brewing mini game. Brilliant. I'll jump over to the world oh, yeah. that's only used to do that. Stand there for 20 minutes and then go away. Yeah, that, that mini game's a big question mark. Like, what's up it with really that? Deep. <laughs> I, I, if anyone that's watching, the way you play Trouble Brewing is you pour buckets of water into another bucket of water for 20 minutes, and then you never do that game again. Yep. yep. That sounds, sounds about right. Your analysis is spot on. We had Mod Goblin on, and we kind of gave him the same question, and he said we really need to work on mid-game. I believe Forestry, which just came out, which was a woodcutting uh, add-on, was supposed to be something that helped players skill together. Because they want to make mid game where you're not so alone. End game, you're not alone. You got raids, multiple raids. Mm -hmm. But what can you really do if your friends mid game that would be impactful? Yeah. So this he kind of brought that up game. and so we're spot on. For, from mm -hmm. from my recent playthroughs, because I, I do a lot of from scratches and I, I constantly remind myself of what the game is like to play through. If you give RuneScape a year and then you make a new account and play through to end game, you might play it a completely different way. The metas change. It's actually quite enjoyable. Um, one of the things that I've noticed and is a thing is that a lot of people quit when they get to the hard grind. Because when you get your stats to the 80s, that's great. And it takes a while to get there. But then the real next significant milestone is getting up to the 99 in your combat skills, which just takes a long time, right? And mm -hmm. I think that's the point when a lot of players decide that they don't want to grind that. And I don't necessarily think that's something that needs to change because, you know, do you cater to the people that want the game to be faster and easier? Or do you just give them more things that they can enjoy in the process up to the end game? So for me, what I would love to see is, you know, more mid-level bosses, uh, more mid-level dungeons, I don't know if people would be happy if they did a raid on it because a lot of end game yes, players want the end game sure. content. But effectively, like there needs to be more gaps filled. Um, You're spot on. So the series You're that I'm on. doing at the moment, I'm killing Callisto, which is the big wilderness bear, and it is by far a mid a mid tier boss to kill. But it's in the wilderness, 
which like not many people want to go to. It's an amazing money maker. It has a drop that's 70 mil and you can kill it with just magic. The, the entry to kill that boss is so low and you can get there in a few days and you can potentially receive a drop that's 70 mil. There's nothing else in the game that I can think of that offers that good a value. But the trouble yeah. is there, there's not too many other options of mm. that that are like outside the wilderness i feel like they need to just fill those gaps in for players to have more of a, pro a progressive fun time instead of just that chunk of grinding i was talking to a couple of the jmods about this and you've you've hit the nail spot on it's something i very much agree with you on that instead of playing the game for the sake of increasing your skills there should always be something within the game that you can use your skills for as in this is my skills this is the challenge that's catered to them. Let's go and do that challenge, whether it's skilling or combat or a group thing. RuneScape old school is very much level and then a step of content and then level and then a step of content and then level and then a step of content. One thing that I will admire RuneScape 3 doing is it's effectively reduced the amount of leveling between the steps of content. So instead of being a staggered up, down, up, down, let's get thing, it's a very smooth progression curve. Now, what we don't want to do is make the leveling quicker so you get to the top really, really fast. What we do want to do is, instead of giving you something to do every 10 levels, maybe there's something to do that's new every two levels. And of course, this is a huge amount of extra content for RuneScape to make, but if I'm 60 strength, 60 attack, 60 defense, 60 hit points, just average kind of base 60s, what do I go and do? What is the perfect balanced experience for a base 60 character i can't quite go and do god wars yet because i can't yet i haven't got those 70 stats to get into god wars i'm probably a little bit beyond the mole i don't really want to be going to do that i could probably go and do that kind of shades of morton mini game maybe I take on the some arrows road, but yeah, yeah. Mm. i could maybe go and do the barrows for a bit for a while and get that let's have a little grind then what do I do? Okay, I'm 65 now. Am I just carrying on to grind until I get to 70 to unlock God Wars? When I'm 70 and unlock God Wars, okay, cool. I'm now 75, I'm now 80. Do I just keep doing God Wars until I get to 90s and then go up to the raids? I like the idea that RuneScape lets you train whatever the hell you want, but in a purely idealistic way, I would also love it if, as an MMORPG player, I can log in, look at my stats, and say, right, the developers of this game have actually created a challenge specifically the level I'm at right now. And if I bring two or three friends, we will have a perfectly balanced experience. The spiffing Brit would be so happy with how perfectly balanced this is what we're about to go and do. RuneScape struggles with the mid game because balanced stuff assumes you have really high stats or kind of like 50s, 60s, then 70s, 80s, then 90s, 99s. But the jump between 80 and 99 is insane. Yeah. I, I think, you know, there's there's a lot of, like, unique issues with this. Like, there's always a bit of a uh, balancing act that Jagex have to do between, you know, appeasing the mid-game players and then appeasing the end-game players. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of volume and noise around that area with, like, wanting new end-game content. And at the end of the day, it still is a relatively small team that's working on these updates. And Jagex and Old School RuneScape has pretty much so far been a case of the content is fantastic, but it just takes a long time to come out, you know? Yeah. There's also that business choice of why would they bother making something for the mid game when the vast majority of players are either going to play it from the start, have to get the good stuff there, work through the grind because everyone else tells them to and then enjoy the end game a good example of a game that does this quite well i give is dungeons and dragons online and that's because dungeons and dragons online has a reincarnation system so when you get to the max level you can either keep playing or reincarnate your character which means you go back to the very start but you carry with you like one extra skill point so you keep reincarnating repeatedly and you are getting more powerful but you're not getting broken levels of powerful you just are noticeably better when you've done like 20 or 30 times but the cool thing is when you've reincarnated multiple times there is a massive amount of mid-game content that you actually don't need to do all of it like you get to the mid-game and you've got seven or eight different epic quest lines you finish one of the epic quest lines you're high enough now to reincarnate so you do it you play the game again but you do a different epic quest line dungeons and dragons online succeeds because it gives you a lot of content at every single level 
you can choose to do in a different way every time you level through. The thing with RuneScape is because you don't reincarnate, because you effectively only go through this content when you're at that level, to make a raid for someone that has base 40s, base 50s, base 60s would be a huge amount of work for something that players are going to naturally out-level. And then we start to look into different, different solutions like you know, level scaling, level it down, level it up. How do we make it specifically based on the amount of players? RuneScape, or as a good MMORPG, should always have something where you can log in and do something challenging for your level. If the challenge that you are asking the player to overcome is grind through your boredom to get yeah. to the good bit, yeah. they're going to go to another game. And I often say, people say to me, World of Warcraft is only focused at endgame. And I say, oh, did you play World of Warcraft years and years and years ago, 2004, 2005? They're like, yeah, I did. I'm like, did you enjoy the dead mines? They're like, oh my god, the dead mines was amazing. What level were you? Ah, the <laughs> dead mines was a very, very low level dungeon that you could do in one of the first areas and was fantastic because it was a challenge curated and balanced for low to mid level players at the time. The danger of focusing entirely on end game is that you forget the rest of the game. Yeah. Mm, what I do want to expand on um, about that, uh, the, the, this adds to the topic, right? It's because, uh, so, so every skill in RuneScape can go from 1 to 99. So realistically speaking, it'd be kind of, you know, too hard to really put out a specific, you know, new update mm -hmm. for every level of every skill, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think, obviously, that's probably never going to happen, no matter how many years, it, it, you know, the game continues. And another thing to note is that I don't think people really have issue with progressing through combat related stuff in, in mm -hmm. RuneScape because uh, as of right now, the dynamic is, is like overwhelmingly PVM, right? It, and when then. You consider it, sorry to jump in there, that yeah. already is balanced for every single level because you do have an enemy in the game that is almost every single combat level. So no matter what your attacks are, you can find an enemy that is perfectly balanced against you at any given time with the style you're using. Combat is an excellent example of actually there is content from 1 to 99 20. the entire Oh my way. god. You've just given yeah, me such exactly. an amazing yeah. idea. Like, because what you've just said is so true, but it's so outside of the scope of old school RuneScape. It just made me think of imagine training an account from level 1 to 126 and each combat level you have to be fighting a monster that is the same level like nobody plays the game like that but that's such an interesting yeah, so, thing yeah but what i want to say in comparison to that is you know i feel like combat you know it's perfectly attractive at the moment right like everyone wants to do it i've noticed that you know the whole um dynamic right between like people that say they're skillers or for, you know like it's shrinking ever more and more uh, and i think the main complaints is more so just skilling in the mm. mid level right like progressing through the skilling because like a lot of the times if you want to unlock some good rewards from like diaries of quest you have to do you know a lot of people ca call them like chores at this point right i would you know <laughs> a lot of people consider them chores and i i guess that's probably what uh, uh needs some tlc or some more additions of content i mean they've done some stuff recently like a lot of uh skilling mini games which really does streamline a lot of like rune crafting like for example you said rune crafting is like incredibly challenging i would say with this new rune crafting mini game it's like definitely gotten a lot more mainstream you could literally train rune crafting from 1 to 99 relatively you know fast compared to before and easily with that single mini games called uh gardens of the rift right for example but I, I think, yes, there still probably needs to be more additions to, like, skilling in the mid-levels just to, yeah. Yeah, but if you want to get a really, a really good visualization of the actual pacing of RuneScape, you've got the recommended quest list, the recommended quest order, which everyone uses the wiki for, which is fantastic because you can click on the thing and it highlights it in a different color, and then you just click what you've done and go down. But if you followed through the optimal quest guide, which I'm sure many people have done, or they've used the optimal quest guide within RuneLight, there's only a couple of times in the early game between quests that say train this skill to this level and it's loads of quests then it's train this skill to this level but when you get to the end game it's like do this quest then train mining from 70 to 80 then do this quest yeah. then train this from this to this then this quest then this from this to this more of those breaks you have of stop doing anything and just train this is a perfect example of there is actually nothing else specifically for this skill at this level to do than just grind it. 
if we were to add a quest in between all of those breaks effectively and kind of fill it up so there is effectively a quest list from start to finish that would be an excellent quest progression that would be a quest progression that almost mirrors the combat progression because runescape does have combat progression for every single level in the game of exactly where you could be or what you could be doing at any time magic has effectively i best enemies to kill at any time you look at ward cutting there's lots of different changes and lots of different trees when you go to this level go and do this this level go and do this all we're doing is just slowly filling in the gaps in between them and it's just like the idea of halving a distance between any points if you have point a and b and you put something in between the half of it then you have a and the half and then you halve it again and then halve it again halve it again eventually you will have halved it enough times that you have effectively something for every level i understand it's not realistic but that's what the development team i think at jagex are doing they are yeah. saying right what can we put in this dead zone if you will this is a dead zone of content all players currently do is grind this is a dead zone all players do is grind what can we put there that makes it slightly more interesting and they've addressed rune uh, rune crafting in runescape 3 they redid mining entirely they redid smithing entirely how can we change this and i think jagex honestly without meaning to suck up to the company too much are one of the better examples of identifying dead zones within their game's kind of play life and putting something there to do yeah I think that's a great idea. I think, I, yeah, I think they're also definitely, you know, trying to fill in the gaps for sure. Like yeah. every year, they they do have weekly updates, and sometimes they do fill in some of those extra, you know, wide spaces of relatively boring skills. Mm. So, so they're, they're definitely no. It's one of those things where, like, I am by no means a skiller. To me, I see skills as a an ends to a means it's like i'll do it because i have to because then i you know i have to complete something in order do to do something i stuff. want to <laughs> but like re here yeah. has taken a particular interest in skilling like for me if there was a way to quest basically all the way up until even let's say 90s in skills i would be for that because i'm not really a skiller but re would probably have a better insight into you know how the the skilling community would feel about that and i imagine i i don't know would, would they be happy oh, about that they or... would tear you up bro wait, 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 wait. <laughs> repeat that again repeat so that again. so if they were to fill in like imagine if they were to effectively make it so the quests could be an alternative to training almost all skills and then like, you could you basically expand the quests over and over well, again is in like they've inserted enough quests so that you can oh. you never have to train agility until like level 90 for example wow I, I don't think they would ever introduce that many quests just because i think you know, it would take a long time how but many yeah. people complain about like if i have to make this account do a hundred more quests i don't want to do it ever again you know? <laughs> it's like but this is the thing so, this is this is why it's an alternative way of training like it, it doesn't have well, to be know, that if, way if anything it doesn't have to be literally every level right it, right it doesn't have to be that that to that extent it, you know they, you're, they're gonna introduce a new quest but it seems like they're pretty content with uh you know putting out like maybe you know three small quests a year one big quest maybe a year kind of, yeah. that, and that's kind of it right like they don't they don't really add that many quests with enough quests with enough rewards for enough skills you're going to be able to have enough experience in the game gets you to 90 92 95 in every skill if you constantly keep putting out quests that have a variety of experience based rewards it's just a you know a issue of time until yeah. we get there this is why ironically the quest cape ends up being one of the hardest skill capes to get it's one of the yeah. only capes that constantly has requirements to get it added onto so people would be annoyed if you could quest your way to 90 agility but if runescape survives for 20 years beyond now no, I definitely there will be quest. enough quests that give agility experience that get you there yeah, yeah. It's I, one of those I'm for it. Where, I like it. You know, it's just one of those facts where over time, you know, you you will get more XP for less time. It, it's just how you know it. It just happens. You know, the power creep does yeah. eventually make it there. But I just really hope they don't like you know throttle it too fast because sometimes you know they'd be. I guess that's a different topic. But yeah. sometimes they, you know they could literally add one thing seems so trivial, but like it just throttles like the the whole dynamic of that skill by like 30 percent increase you know when yeah. dungeoneering released they forgot to reset the experience from the dungeoneering based rune essence so oh, what yeah. happened on the first hour of day one was people went into daemonheim and they had a thousand rune essence and they clicked make nature runes on the altar 
And in Damonheim, you make runes about 10 times faster because you can't take them out of Damonheim. So people were able to go from about 50 runecrafting to 99 within about two hours. I remember, yeah, I remember you that could just keep I heard about selling it. runes, buying rune essence, making them, selling, buying, and they had to do a massive reset on that. And mm. people were like, no, that, that's way too fast. You can't do that. So yeah. we all agreed that's too fast. But then we release the rune crafting mini game, which allows it to be much more fun, much more enjoyable, and slightly quicker than it was before. And we're all totally okay with that. So the question now becomes where is this line in the sand that's somewhere between two hours in Damonheim and couple of weeks in the runecrafting minigame there is a point but we don't know where it is and the problem yeah, is just like the people becoming accustomed to it over time it will slowly creep up until it's easier and easier and easier and easier and yeah. that's why the enfranchised long-term players push back against any changes because they don't want it to get too easy and the players who are going through the grind want it to be slightly easier than it is and you end up with this battle yeah. No one knows where the point should be. It's really hard to balance, that's for sure. Yeah. But I think we all can agree on that. Like, we don't, like, I think we all agree that there's definitely a point where it's too fast. But I think what we can't agree on is like, what is right? You know, what is like a good speed? Right. That, that's the hard part. Yeah. Because the easier like, it is, the less the prestige yeah. for getting it. Yeah. Exactly. And the, the less struggle you have to go through, as we discussed earlier, the less the, you know, the validation for going through the struggle. Because seeing with a runecrafting cape, is digital validation for doing oh, something such flex such flex. yeah and you're, you're being seen by people in the in group like if i were to say to my grandparents you know hey gran i've got a, an untrimmed slayer cape she'd go oh that's nice dear but you say that to anyone else and they're like oh god damn that's really impressive achievements within runescape are digital flexes that's only relevant to the in group but the in-group yeah. understand, and the in-group almost gatekeep how impressive that flex is by what they let the developers add to it. And the easier it gets, the less the people that have it are impressive. But then you've got this horrible dynamic where the people that don't yeah. have it, yeah, people that don't have something want it. So when you say, I'm going to make it easier, some of them go, yes, this is good. It's going to be easier to get. But some of them understand, hang on, the easier it is to get, the less of a flex it is. Therefore, ironically, it wouldn't actually help me. Yeah. I mean, I it's like I... things... Yeah, go ahead. I, I'm not much of a skiller myself, but I do see the importance of whichever skill it is. I, I firmly believe that there should be a way of training that skill that is an absolute hell to train, such mm -hmm. as the Guardians of the Rift for runecrafting. But at the same time, I feel like there should always be an insanely sweaty tick manipulative way of doing it for way more xp because you're putting in way more effort i i don't mm -hmm. think that should ever change and you know i i can completely understand both sides of the argument um recently there's been like a whole controversy around shooting stars where oh, you can effectively get like twenty thousand mining xp for one click in an hour and there are people that are really upset with it and then there's people that are really happy with it and it's like stuff like that. I, I try not to pay too much attention because I'm just like, this is such a ridiculous argument. It's like 20,000 mining XP, in my opinion, isn't even worth the one click. I'd rather just go and click iron ore, be a bit sweaty and get three or four times as much XP an hour. But that's, that's just me. But yeah, I, I do think that there should always be a sweaty way of doing things. And I think that those players should be rewarded substantially for the extra effort they put in. I don't think that should change. The question is, as a community and as a you know, collective of RuneScape players, we have to agree, right, this is the challenge, this is the achievement, this is the kind of digital flex weight that it has, this is where it should sit. And the problem is Jagex will want to make something that improve it. When you create minigame for a skill that gives experience slower than the current training methods, everyone says it's pointless to do. Why on earth would you do this if it's slower than the training methods? And they say, well, okay, we have to give the minigame a reason for people to do it, because people want the experience, they don't want the experience. As in, they just want the numbers from it, they don't necessarily want to play it for a specific reason. So you then have to work out what the hell is worth giving this thing to make people want to go and do it. It's yeah. a horrible balancing act, and I would not want to make an MMORPG, which is why yeah. then someone says, what's the next big MMO going to come out? They've got so many hurdles to jump over. Yeah. 
you, you talk about RuneCraft and Cape. If a brand new MMO came out that was better than RuneScape, that had a grind in it longer than the RuneCrafting Cape, and you had a RuneCrafting Cape, would you want to go and do it? Or would you want to say, nah, man, I've got my RuneCrafting Cape. I'm going to stay here. I've put my time and dedication into this game. I want to stick with this digital flex within this community. You know what? Yeah. Hey, here's a question, and it might be slightly controversial. Um, are you happy about sailing passing and coming into the game? I'm glad that RuneScape is getting another skill. I know people will hate me for saying that, but I genuinely am glad that RuneScape is getting another skill, because if it doesn't get another skill, I very much think it runs the risk of doing what EverQuest has had to do, which is repeatedly release progression servers, repeatedly go back to classic. Hey, it's exactly how it was a while ago. RuneScape, as it is if you play on RuneLite, old school RuneScape, is older now than I think RuneScape was when old school RuneScape released. Like, it is so far removed from what it originally was it effectively is a different game from what originally released as old school changes have been made things have been added we have to understand that if you play on rune light at all you're playing old school runescape in a totally different way to the way that you would have been playing it back in actual 2007 so we've already said that look we can add new things to it what we have to work out now is what is the essence of old school what yeah. is the essence of what makes this game what it is? And one of the strangest things is that we have so many updates now of uh, a skill before it comes out that we're almost expected to have an opinion on every step. Remember when there was a meme someone put up? Remember when you came home from school, loaded up RuneScape, and it's like, new skill, Hunter. I'm like, oh, I have no idea what the hell this is. Here's an entire new skill. I haven't read anything about it. Here's an entire new part of the game straight away. Because of the new development cycle of everyone knowing everything all the time, every step they take is being critiqued. I want sailing to be an adventure. I yeah. want sailing to be an old school RuneScape adventure, and I want us to enjoy it. And I want Jagex to care about it and build it into the game. Because if fire making was polled as a skill now, it wouldn't pass. Mm -hmm. Half it's... of those skills would Yeah, they wouldn't pass at all. So when people go, oh, this is an old school RuneScape. I'm sorry, Mr. Using a tile marker, calculating ticks on <laughs> RuneLite, doing all these insanely difficult things that you wouldn't have had back in 2007. We're not playing RuneScape as it was then at all. This needs to be added to very slowly and very carefully. Yeah, it definitely does, I think, have the biggest potential to be an adventure. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we did a podcast a few months ago where... We, we sat down, we spoke about all of the skills that they, they were polling, and we all came to the conclusion that it just had to be sailing. We were like, <laughs> this is the only skill that it can really be. And uh, a big selling point for me is, you know, this is the first time, firstly, it fits into the game because there's ocean everywhere. It's yeah. like, why can't we sell? And then secondly... And it's medieval there... as hell. You exactly. Yeah. And, then, and then there's also places on the world map that are just like blacked off right now. And it's like, I wonder what's over there, what's up here, what's down there. It's like mm -hmm. it opens up a whole new world. It's like RuneScape has never had an expansion of sorts. And this could be pretty much a full well, blown expansion minus, potential. Minus Zaya, minus Zaya. Oh, yeah. Zaya was the biggest expansion. And the weird thing is, when I come back and replay old school RuneScape, I still don't even consider that landmass as existing because in my mind it just doesn't. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, it's not really a lot bad. Better. I just, I just don't engage with it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know exactly what you mean. And, you know, that was literally me with Zaya for the first few years because I'm like, yo, did they just release literally a square land mm. and it's like ha it's like 90% empty, you know? It yeah. very much but, feels to me like a fan made freeware kind of shareware patch that someone said hey look we found the tile set that runescape uses and i've run yeah. around and i'm like yeah you've got the tile set but you've not quite understood the vibe this is all a little bit too square the paths are a little bit too long if you there's a great example you guys played san andreas on uh, on oh, ps2 yeah. Grand Theft Auto san andreas. you know if you can remove the the fog the mist and zoom out san andreas is not that like you can actually see the entire island in one go. If you can zoom out of RuneScape, it's not that far apart. A lot of the cities, like Falador and Varrock, actually really close together geographically. 
Now, it never felt that way as a kid because you had the fog, you had such a small draw distance. It felt like a massive journey to get from one to the other. Everywhere. But you can actually see they're actually really close together. I feel that what Z has done is they've taken that things are far apart feeling and they've made it things are actually far apart when they never were. Yeah. I, I think yeah. in, you know, do credit to Jagex, it was a massive task to put that continent mm. onto the map, and they have changed it quite a lot since its release, so, and they, they've made it better for sure. Yeah. yeah. I but, think I'm in the middle. I think I'm in the middle of it because uh, many years ago now, four years ago, they released uh, their first league ever, right? It's called Twisted League, right? And, yes. and the premise of Twisted League was that you had to start from, from level, you know, level three, on Zaya only, right? So, so it was like, man, that doesn't sound fun at all. But then, once I got like, I gave it a try, it actually did feel like a fairly fleshed out piece of land at that point because you know it's already been like four years since the initial update, and like they added like a lot of like low level stuff and mid level stuff. So, so when I played it, I was actually able to make sense of progression within just that uh, you know area itself. So, so I think it has definitely gone a lot better because. You know, I was able to like do like low level stuff and then, you know, get myself a rune guitar at some point from like, you know, this really new place that came out maybe a year ago before, but like nobody ever messed with those. Uh, there was so many, so many content they added, right? But because nobody gave a shit about Zaya for a long time, it was only until Twisted League where people, it was kind of like playing a new game almost. Everyone's like, oh, I heard rumors that uh, if you go to this dungeon, you kill the skeleton, you can get a rune guitar. And then everyone was like, you know, just watching like their favorite content creators investigate and see if it, it was true, and it turned out to be true. And it was like, you know, it's yeah. this crazy re, re uh, reliving uh, RuneScape, but except it's like a different region. It, in comparison, so, the next sort of expansion of island they're doing is they're adding a place called Valamore. I don't know if you've heard of that, Josh. Wait, what? They're yeah, they're at yeah. Valamore. I too much now. You oh, you no. guys that have heard of like this? World of Warcraft, bro. Have you have you not seen it yet? The um, it's got like Valamore. a. It's got yeah, like a no, gladiator like arena and stuff like that. I haven't yeah, looked yeah. into that now. I'm excited oh, okay. about it. So it, it, it looks amazing, firstly. It does. And Way it's there. effectively, it looks like a big harbor of sorts. Like there's a massive harbor to it, which obviously will really tie in. At sailing, yeah, you know? yeah. Sailing is going to tie it could, into that. It could tie in super well. Map. But I think that it's a fair bit smaller. It's still going to be big. But I think that it's just about the right size where they should hopefully be able to flesh out a bit mm. better compared to the whole of Zaya, which was a massive project. Um, but no, you should certainly take oh. a look. They're, they're adding like yeah, a gladiator yeah. pit that's supposed to have like an infinitely difficult PVM experience inside, okay. is, is what they've said. They tried that with the Dominion Tower for a while, didn't they, where you could just keep adding on different modifiers and fighting all the way through it. And I did that for ages and ended up with like 50 different Dominion crossbows in my bank, which I never ended yeah. up using. But uh, lots Here's of... the new map. This is great. If it. if what they're doing is filling in gaps within kind of the mid game with this, they're like, okay, guys, you've you've grinded all your skills. Go over here now. There's something perfectly built for you. It'll be fantastic, chaps. Unfortunately, it has been three hours, so I need to head off and get my beauty sleep. I'm an old man now. Yeah, that's no uh, problem. I need to make sure I take care of the bags under my eyes. But genuinely, thank you so much for taking the time mm. to chat to me. Thank you for sharing your passion about RuneScape and MMORPGs with me. Hey man, it's oh, been yeah, a it's, it's been a pleasure yeah. having you. Thank you for coming on. You know, when I sent you the message, I didn't even think you were going to see it. To be totally honest, so thank you so see, much for your time, dude. I see every single message everyone sends me, whether it's on Twitter or Discord, and I try my absolute best to respond. There's lots of them. Most of them are just shouting at me for being wrong about someone's personal <laughs> favorite MMORPG. But if you're putting the effort and the energy and the passion into creating something within this space, this space needs more creators who are knowledgeable, passionate, and very importantly, friendly about it. So I lose my best. Anyway, chaps, thank you so much for having me. Take care. Good night. I'll see you later. Have see you later. Have a good one, bro.